I'm going to be watching Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin, Yaron Brook, and Greg Salmieri have a panel discussion. It's something like Philosophy and the Human Soul, and it's from Ocon, which is the Objectivist main conference. And I haven't watched it yet. I'm going to be pausing and giving my comments as I go along. I'm skeptical about inviting Jordan Peterson to an objectivist event because he's not an objectivist. He's not one of those people who just totally hates Ayn Rand, but he thinks that she's not very good. So this is the Ocon website, and you see all this Ayn Rand stuff, and so he doesn't really fit the theme. And then here's how they advertise it. Here's how they sell it. Meeting people, especially at the opening reception. There's no other place you can go to get this kind of total immersion in Rand's life-flourishing ideas with over 500 rational, cool, like-minded people from around the world. It was a real spiritual boost for me. So Jordan Peterson breaks the, quote, total immersion in Rand's ideas. So does Dave Rubin. The selling point is supposed to be something like, you can get a spiritual boost because in your daily life, you're around all these non-objectivists with terrible ideas all the time, and it's frustrating and it gets you down. And then you come hang out with like-minded people, and it's like a little taste of living in an objectivist world. It's supposed to be like um, Galt's Gulch, where they went for a month every summer, and one month out of the year, they would be with like-minded people. And Jordan Peterson just contradicts that uh, theme of the event. So that's why I'm concerned that he shouldn't have been invited, and I'm going in with a negative opinion of just having this panel at all. So before I get into the video, I need to help you watch this, because I'm going to watch the video at two and a half speed, um, not one speed, because otherwise I would get bored. So. The parts where I talk are going to be at one speed, and the parts where the panelists are talking are going to be at two and a half speed. So that might be a problem for you. So here's how you can deal with it. Uh, download Chrome. If you don't have it, uh, just Google search for Chrome, and you'll find a download page. You need to use a computer, not mobile. And then once you have Chrome, uh, Google search for video speed controller. You can also get the link in the description. and this is an extension for Chrome that lets you change the speed of videos. And then once you have it, so you go to the video and it adds this little thing. So there's settings and there are hotkeys and you can set a preferred speed. And there's two important hotkeys here that'll let you swap speeds with one button press. There's preferred speed and there is reset speed. So if I'm watching it and it's on 2.6, I'm just going to hit R and it goes to 1.0. This is regarded by his current and I hit R again, and it goes to 2.6. So I'm just tapping R, and it's swapping between two speeds. So if you want to watch a 1.0 plus something else, you can just use R to toggle between them, R for resetting to normal, and then back to where you were. Alternatively, you can set the preferred speed to whatever you want. So I have the preferred speed on 2.6. And when I hit G, it's going to toggle between the preferred and something else. So I'm going to go down, and let's put this at like 1.4 or 1.3, and then I can toggle between 2.6 and 1.3. So you can pick whatever two speeds you want and swap between them. You just have to go to the settings and make one of the speeds you want it has to either be 1.0 and you can use reset, or it has to be something that you put as the preferred speed. And then you can toggle just with one button press. Whenever I'm talking, you hit the button, and whenever they're talking, you hit the button, and then you'll have two different speeds for us. Uh, what speed should you use? If you want to slow down the Ocon people, you could use uh, 0.4, because I have it at 2.5. So if you multiply that by 0.4, you will get normal speed. So you could use 0.4 for them and 1 for me, and then you'll just have normal speed. Alternatively, you might want to use a bit faster than that. I bet you could listen at more than one speed and save some time if you wanted to. Okay, so that's how to watch the video with video speed controller. So you can go back and forth and fix the speeds.
And I'm just going to watch in VLC and full screen now. So I have not watched this before. It, uh, they just announced it in the newsletter today. I guess it came out on Sunday. And today is July 5th. So it came out four days ago. But they just announced it in their newsletter today, so I just saw it. I don't know why they... They, they, they made like a really big deal out of this. And they're like, oh my god, we got Jordan Peterson, and he's popular, and he's going to bring in all these fans. Which is, uh, you know, it, it sounds kind of like Gail Wynand in the, the papers, where they were seeking popularity. But anyways, it seems weird to me that after they promoted it and they thought it was a big deal, that they send out a newsletter and they're like, you can watch the video now, and they do that four days after it was live-streamed. Like, they could have just sent it out right after the live-stream and let me know it was available to watch. So, I don't know why they didn't do that. So, okay, the topic is good. The impact of philosophy on a person's life. Uh, that sounds like a good topic. It's not going to be Jordan Peterson's, like, gender pronoun stuff. Which is good stuff, but it's not objectivism. So this is, like, much more relevant to an objectivist conference, so hopefully they'll uh, stay on topic and not get into politics. The video's not playing? Oh wait, it is. Now it's playing. Okay, there's just nothing happening. Okay, good enough. Wonderful to have this forum here. I'm so excited to actually start with a dinner. We had enough time. The idea of bringing Dave and Jordan Peterson here came about and actually happened. So I'm just going to introduce not too much time for the people standing here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Jordan Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a professor at the University of Toronto. He was nominated for the prestigious Levinson Teaching Prize when he was a professor at Harvard and is regarded by his current University of Toronto students and colleagues as one of the three truly life changing teachers. Dr. Peterson is a prominent international speaker and a public personality. Dave Rubin. Mr. Rubin is a talk show. Okay, so they're just praising Peterson. Like that introduction was purely positive. They're not like, this guy thinks Ayn Rand wasn't that great. We're going to argue with him and see if we can change his mind. You know, it's not at all a challenging introduction. It's just, this guy's great, we're happy to have him, you know. They're they're sanctioning him, they're saying he's a good person. Which, I, I don't think that's what Ayn Rand would have done. He's, Jordan Peterson is a very mixed person. Like, he's definitely good in some ways. He has some good ideas, he's good on some issues. And he's really bad on a bunch of other issues. According to the objectivist perspective, and my perspective, at least. Like, the people hosting this conference think that he's quite bad on a bunch of issues. They'd never introduce Paul Krugman this way. They wouldn't say, he's a well-respected economist, and just sort of leave it at that. It's so wonderful to have Paul Krugman. So many people think he's a great economist. He's won prizes. You know, they would say, uh, Paul Krugman is here to debate us. <laughs> and, you know, they, they'd give him, like, a proper introduction, like, you know, he's respected, blah, blah, something, like, objective, but they'd also be presenting it as... You know, we disagree with him, and we're going to have a debate, and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. They wouldn't. It wouldn't just be purely friendly. So Jordan Peterson is getting like much better treatment, and he's better than Paul Krugman, but he shouldn't be getting just the friendly treatment at Ocon. And I'm concerned that they're not going to be challenging enough towards him in the discussion. Host, media, and media personality. He's the host of the Rubin Report, a talk show about big ideas and free speech. It has been a rolling, whereas it's in, politically incorrect and honest approach to discussing complex issues and current events focusing on politics, religion, and the media. Dr. Ron Brook is the chairman. Why did they have Rubin? Like, I don't get it. Um, why not have an objectivist host? Like, if you're going to talk to Jordan Peterson, who's not an objectivist, why don't you have an objectivist host at least? Like, they have a non objectivist host. And they had a debate with Rubin or a panel or whatever. It was Ruben, Jordan Peterson, and Ankar Gatte, who is an ARI objectivist. ARI is the Ayn Rand Institute. So they already tried that. And Ankar is the person they wanted for this panel, but uh, he couldn't make it for some reason. So they were going to have him again. And it was him, Peterson, and Ruben. And Ruben was totally friendly to Peterson. He wasn't a neutral moderator or host or whatever. 
And and the whole thing, like, Peterson dominated the discussion. He came off looking good. Like, never mind the intellectual arguments, just as a general impression of, like, the social dynamics. Uh, Peterson looked good, talked a lot, seemed confident, you know, sounded like he knew what he was talking about, sounded well-spoken, all sorts of good things. And Ankar just, like, didn't stand out and didn't challenge him much. It, it wasn't, like, a successful way to be like, look, we're, we're more powerful intellectuals than this guy. Now, it's possible some people will listen to every word that was said and evaluate the arguments and think that Ankar won or had some important points or whatever. But, you know, they're they're trying to get a chunk of Jordan Peterson's audience interested in them. And Jordan Pe- Peterson's audience is used to charismatic, skilled speakers like Jordan Peterson, who they're used to watching. And if objectivism... Uh, can't offer that they don't look so good like how are you going to win over the supporters when jordan peterson is like dominating you in charisma and the host is on his side like you might win over like a, a very small number of people who are very intellectually oriented and don't care very much about social dynamics you know the same kind of people who don't even care whether there's a video or not don't care at looking at the people um, and maybe would prefer a text debate where they could just read the arguments rather than... Because IRL debates like this are a show. They're a performance. People are putting on an act in front of an audience and uh, making impressions on the audience. It's not like a, a written document where you're very carefully trying to figure out the truth. It's a different kind of thing. So social factors are super relevant. Uh, the like i don't think people should evaluate things by social factors but one they do and two if your goal is to reach a large audience then you have to deal with that's how people evaluate things and that's what they're doing they're like compromising on having an objectivist speaker in order to get a popular guy so if you're going to do that you should uh be good at appealing to the mainstream which in general what i've seen as objectivism isn't so we'll we'll see how these guys do and uh, he's the author of Don Watkins of the Pursuit of Wealth, a Equally Unfair, and the National Bestseller of, of Free Market Revolution, 2012. He is the host of the Iran Book Show on Talk Talk Radio. And uh, Greg Salieri, Dr. Salieri, teaches philosophy at Rutgers, Rutgers University and is a fellow at the Anthem Foundation for Objective Scholarships and post secretary of the Ayn Rand Society. He's co editor of the Companion to Ayn Rand and Black Book Companion to Philosophy Series. Welcome to those four. And one word about uh, the person who made it possible, a uh, generous board member of the Ayn Rand Institute. And thank you to High, Gra- sorry, High Road Productions from Eden So here we go. Okay, so they all got positive intros. Uh, there was some sort of donor, High Road Productions, and we're going to get started. So first off, to begin, we are live streaming this on my channel, and as I'm sure many of you guys saw, I was on Joe Rogan. Okay, hold on. Why is it live streamed on Dave's channel? Like, shouldn't it be streamed on, like, an objectivism channel? Like, doesn't Ocon want to host their own content? Why are they, like, this is an Ocon panel. Why are they giving away the content to Dave Rubin to, like, promote his channel? That doesn't make sense to me. And yeah, Rubin's channel is where I got the video. A couple weeks ago, we talked a little bit about objectivism, and he said that you guys are very serious people. And you're, you're very no. serious people, so I need you guys to go absolutely bananas for the thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of people that will be watching this at home. He made some noise. Crazy. <laughs> that made no sense. He said, You guys are really serious people, so I need you to go bananas and cheer a lot. Like, if you're serious people, that means you're like not into cheering, so he's trying to make them do something like contrary to their values. That's how he presented it. Like, that's weird. I don't know what was the point of saying that. Like, he's framing it as you're not really a cheering audience, so please cheer a lot. Wow. <laughs> hey, look at you guys, you crazy objectivists. All right. You're such a, you're such a negative influence. Yeah, now he's calling them crazy, and he's being called a negative influence. Like. Everyone, the objectivists are just laughing. They're not standing up for values. They're not saying, hey, I think what you just did is bad. That was bad. He said, you guys are serious, or, or so I've been told. Let's, like, prove them wrong and prove you guys are crazy and will go bananas and you're perfectly happy to just, you know, cheer and call it bananas, which is, like, completely unserious. And the objectivists are just laughing instead of being like, this is a serious panel. Why are you making a mockery of it? Or at least just, like, opening with irrelevant stuff. Like, Ruben's being an entertainer. Which is what he does, and it's what I expected. But why is that at Ocon, and why is, like, Ruben's entertainment show at Ocon? 
you guys, we have the whole audience screaming out George Carlin's senator. That's true, that's true. I don't know if we're going to do that no. this time. Okay, so we're going to do about an hour and a half with you guys. We're going to throw in some Q&A, obviously completely uncensored and in the spirit of free speech and individuality that you guys are uh, talking about here at this conference. Uh, so, Gordon, we've been on tour now for almost two months, and we have a little break right now, but why don't we just dive right back into all the things we've been talking about so much of your, your tour for your 12 Rules for Life book has been about... So, we're going to open not with a philosophy topic, not with how does philosophy apply to human life, not with an objectivist presenting an objectivist idea, not with Jordan Peterson presenting his ideas about philosophy, but with Jordan Peterson's tour. Like, hi, I know you guys are all watching to see Jordan Peterson because you're Jordan Peterson fans, so we'll just have Jordan Peterson talking about his stuff, which is what happened at the previous one with, with Ankar Gatte. It was a lot of Jordan Peterson talking about himself and his stuff. And the, the audience Q&A was also, everyone wanted to talk to Jordan Peterson. This audience might be more, more mixed, but I don't know. We'll see. Role of the individual. So before we get too deep in, into philosophy and, and some of the other things, I thought that would be a great place to start because that sort of like unifies all four of us up here. Yeah, well, I've been making the case, I suppose, or, or developing the argument. It's not everybody knows to some degree, although I don't think we've done a very good job of articulating it um, over the last few decades that you know, it's, it's no secret that our free societies or the free societies of the world are predicated on the idea of the sovereign individual. Right? And that's, that's, the, that's the place where political power ultimately resides, that's a political authority. But, and it's also, in some sense, the derivation source of the idea of rights, the fact that the individual is sovereign, the individual has inalienable rights. And we talk a lot about rights in our society, way too much as far as I'm concerned, not that they're not important, but they're secondary, because the fundamental uh, issue of import with regards to individual sovereignty isn't rights, it's responsibility. I mean, first of all, you can make a case that your rights are my responsibility and vice versa. So, so there's a parallelism between. Peterson says the fundamental issue is responsibilities, not rights. So that's wrong, and it's it's not where you start the discussion. Like we're not framing the discussion properly with like a proper question to address. He's just sort of starting in the middle, and the, his it's such a false dichotomy: rights against responsibilities. Like I I know why he's saying it. Like. At a higher, less philosophical level, you can see uh, a contrast between like your positive privileges and your duties and obligations and responsibilities. And part of Jordan Peterson's message is that you will be happier and more fulfilled if you're actually a responsible person. And that is actually, in many ways, a better thing for you to focus on in your life for your own benefit than your privileges and uh, like gifts and wonderful positive things. Like you need to have something like serious in your life and some some things that matter that you're working on and that aren't just light and airy. Like a serious relationship or a child or a career that you care about and that it's not just like, I'll do a bit of my career when I feel like, a, you know, whenever it happens to be convenient. It's like you take on actual responsibilities to make it an important, fulfilling, ongoing, serious project. Like, you know, you take on uh, like a position in a company where you have responsibilities. You know, you, you have to get this much work this done to help advance what you're doing or uh, you could be in like a volunteer organization or something where uh, you have some ideas and you take on like a, some sort of leadership role and, you know, you show up at the monthly meetings and you, you do stuff. And it's not just uh, whatever you feel like whenever you feel like it. So there, there's some merit in that kind of thing. I don't think it's like the perfect perspective, but I can see how it would help some people and... There, there's definitely a, a culture of irresponsibility that tries to tell people to to try to avoid responsibilities and responsibilities are bad and just stay away from them and then you'll have a better life because you've avoided all the nasty things. And that's not how you get a fulfilling life. Like you need to... F Dodging responsibilities certainly isn't the way to run your life. Like figure out what you want and figure out how to get it. And if that involves some responsibilities, um, you might actually find you like them and that they give some meaning to your life. So, like, that's kind of what Jordan Peterson talks about in general and what he seems to be bringing up. But rights are not privileges. Like, think, think about this from an objectivist perspective. Like, what kind of rights does objectivism care about and talk about? Like, the right to life, liberty, and property. The right to your person to not be killed, to be free. You know? And that's very important and does not at all contrast with responsibilities as like an alternative. You know, it's completely compatible that you have basic rights like free speech and not to have your property stolen from you and not to be shot at. 
that there's just no choice between that and uh you know taking on the responsibility of raising a child or something like just do both But even more importantly, if the integrity of the state is dependent on the integrity of the individual, and, and, and that's the argument that's implicit in the idea that the individual is sovereign, then it's obviously the case that the individual has a great responsibility, and it's a responsibility that's of incre incredible importance, but it's not just limited to you. It's, it's you, you acting responsibly actually constitutes the bedrock of the state. And so, so that's an interesting issue. I mean, it, it, it means that you're required in some sense to take responsibility or the entire state will shake, and I think that's true for everyone. But more interestingly, <clears throat> I think this is a more interesting argument in some sense, is that... So now he's saying, like, you have to take responsibility or the, the state will fall apart. This is, like, that's nasty. That's anti-individualist. That's collectivism. That's... It's trying to put a burden on the citizens, like, to have this duty to the government. And, like, that's how he's opening the panel. And there's no proper framing here of, like, what what issues are we discussing and uh, how, how should we put them in perspective? Like, the, the topic is not properly framed, and they just let Jordan Peterson open and talk about whatever, and it's a mess. Like, he isn't... Uh, doing a good job as a philosopher presenting this is what the topic is this is why it's an important topic here's uh how to use philosophy to approach the topic and organize it he's just sort of jumping into the middle and saying things and they shouldn't have let him do this like they should be taking control of the conversation and saying okay so we're the philosophers here and you're not so we're going to open and we're going to we're going to tell you here's how we organize this issue using our philosophy and then we want to hear if you have any corrections to this, or you have an alternative organization, or do you just have like a jumble of different ideas, some of which are compatible with this and some differ. And, you know, try, try to show the value of philosophy and actually use it in the discussion. But that's not happening so far. You need a meaning to sustain you through life, or you need meaning, perhaps not have meaning. You need meaning to sustain you through life, because life is very difficult and, 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 and ultimately challenging, morally challenging for that matter. And you need a meaning to sustain you through that so that it doesn't embitter you and turn you into a victim, let's say. Life is like bitterly difficult and stuff. Another Jordan Peterson theme that, that contradicts objectivism, which rejects the malevolent universe and says basically life is nice. Life life is a high value. It's not just like misery and suffering. Like there doesn't have to be suffering in life as a theme in Atlas Shrugged. And it's pretty obvious to me, and I think obvious to anyone, when they think it through, that virtually everything that you derive genuine meaning from, and I mean the kind of meaning that will sustain you in times of difficult, that will mean casual happiness, even though there's nothing wrong with happiness, well, the, the meaning that will sustain you through the tragedy of life is always to be found in the adoption of responsibility. And the people that you admire spontaneously, I don't think there's an exception to this, unless you're a little on the psychopathic side. And I mean that technically. Um, you, you feel, I, do, I, mean, I mean it technically, it's like it's a hallmark of psychopathy, I would say. Generally speaking, you admire yourself to the degree that you do when you're at least taking care of yourself, at least that, maybe when you have a little responsibility left over for your family, and maybe some to spill over for the broader community. And certainly the people that you. So he's kind of saying what I was talking about earlier. Also, he means responsibilities like more broadly than duties. Like he's talking about just if you take care of yourself, then you're responsible for yourself. Like you're acting responsibly in regards to your own life. So even if you don't like, uh, you know, have a boss telling you to do it or, or have committed to other people to do particular things on particular days or something, you can still be like acting responsibly in regards to your life, taking responsibility for, you know, feeding yourself, clothing yourself, uh, educating yourself, making your life go well. Which is fine, like that's good, but that's not like a contrast to rights. Like this isn't framed well. It's spontaneously admire in your in your fellow men are people who at minimum are accounting for their for the burden of themselves at the minimum that but then who have excess capacity to devote that to the proper care of their family and their community and so i don't think that we've done a good job of laying out the meaning equals responsibility uh, equation and it's, it's vitally important and i think it's very helpful for people to learn that lots of people told me that, that, that you know that they've been getting their lives together and digging out of themselves out of a nihilistic and hopeless hole and doing that by understanding that the meaning they need to sustain them is to be found through the adoption of the maximum responsibility they can sustain and so well that's that's become clearer to me over the course of these last let's say 50 lectures so i tell you not long there like so to some extent peterson is saying like, actually do stuff. Don't just avoid doing stuff. If you do stuff, you'll be happier. Which is totally fine, but, like, why is he saying that? Why is that the topic? And and what exactly does that have to do with rights? Like, that's, that's tangential to rights, orthogonal to rights, perpendicular to rights. It's not... It's not, like, rights versus responsibilities. And he didn't even try to explain how it is or what he thinks rights are. Thing. And so, well, that's that's become clearer to me over the course of these last, let's say, 50 lectures. So, Greg, I saw you're not along there. Like, you put some of this within an objectivist frame. Yeah, well, I mean, not to plug, but I gave a talk actually that I met you at, called Taking Responsibility for Your Happiness. So, Rubens 
comment on all that was, can you put some of this in an objectivist frame? In other words, take the stuff Jordan Peterson said, and then tell us how objectivism agrees with it. And uh, this is Greg Salmieri, and his, his first word in response to that was, yeah, he's not going to argue with it. He's not going to say, uh, you know, actually, objectivism has a different view of this. He's just going to, you know, be friendly and try to agree with Peterson in ways that he can, I think. Um, I have a different view of happiness than you do, and the man has a different view than you do. Um, where I mean happiness isn't the transient joy or emotion you feel in a moment. Oh, so first he says, yeah, but then he starts disagreeing. So I'm glad he's disagreeing, but why did he open with the yeah? The different view of happiness than you do. Well, I mean, not to talk, but I gave a talk actually that I met you at. Great, I saw you nodding along there a lot. Can you put some of this within an objective frame? Yeah, well, I mean... Ruben even said Greg was nodding, so like... Ruben is implying that Greg agrees with Jordan, and then Greg says yeah, which means he agrees with Jordan, but then he starts disagreeing. That's so confusing. Like, is he just scared to challenge people openly? Is this like standard con conflict avoidance behavior where they just present things more positively than they should? Uh, we'll see how it goes. Not to talk, but I gave a talk actually that I met you at while taking responsibility for your happiness. Um, I have a different view of happiness than you do, and a man has a different view than you do. Um, where I mean by happiness isn't the transient joy or emotion you feel in the moment, but the, the state of being, the state of emotion that comes from accomplishing, achieving your values, having taken responsibility, set yourself goals, and leading a life where you're achieving those goals over time. And I think. So, Greg might be in trouble here because I'm not. I'm skeptical that Jordan Peterson will agree that Greg has stated Jordan Peterson's view of happiness correctly. Jordan Peterson did not state his view of happiness in the mini speech he gave so far. And now Jordan Peterson, or Greg just attributed to Jordan a very like standard conventional naive view of happiness and said he disagrees with that. And I think Jordan's going to say back, oh, I disagree with that view of happiness too. I also have a sophisticated view of happiness. So I, I think Greg's already got himself in trouble by putting words in Jordan Peterson's mouth that I don't think Peterson's going to accept. Like, I've watched a lot of Peterson videos, and I don't recall him saying that. So I don't think this is just like Greg did his research and knows that's Jordan's view. Uh, I, I think Greg is just screwing up. First thing he says, screwing up. That's what I think that's what you mean by it. I really think part of that is taking responsibility for yourself. I would, I'm a little bit bristled at the idea of saying that responsibility is more important than rights or the reverse. I think there, there are issues that come out of different tiers. So I think taking responsibility for yourself is Okay, this is good. He noticed that rights and responsibilities, like, you don't just pick one, they're, they're different things. <laughs> It's a matter of how you live your own life. It's a matter of how you live a life worth living and be happy and have meaning to go together. Um, but then rights are the conditions that we need to organize as a society to make everybody able to do that, not to be completely dependent on each other. And if we don't all value our own lives and happiness, if we're not all taking responsibility, or at least many of us aren't, we're not going to have a society that cares about rights and they're going to go away. And um, so that's the we need to have shift talking about ethics and uh, what one may want to do. So that's good that he gave some defense of rights. Because Jordan Peterson's like attack on rights just made no sense and wasn't elaborated on much. Yeah, I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, the individual, I think one of the points that he's. Why does he open with, yeah, I mean, uh? Like, and Greg did something similar. It was very similar. Like, he said something about, he said, yeah, and then he said something about, I mean. Like, I think it was seriously really similar. But, like, this is a weak thing to say. It's socially weak. It makes you look like an unconfident, shy nerd who doesn't have charisma and doesn't know how to talk to a group. And it's a waste of time. It's filler. Like, he said, uh. I don't think Greg said, uh, but Yaron did. I say uh sometimes, but I'm a writer, and I'm not going on stage and thinking that I should represent objectivism on stage with a video camera, and, you know, I, I think someone with charisma should go on stage. Like, don't they have anyone with charisma? If you're going to have, like, a live event that's videotaped and people are going to evaluate how your, like, stage presence and how you look and stuff, then... You know, they should get someone who's good at that and say, look, objectivism can win this game. Like, objectivism should either say, we're not going to play the social debate game because it's irrational, or they should win. But you shouldn't play it and lose. That's that's stupid. And so this is just such a weak opener. And it's such like a beginner mistake. Like, you don't have to know very much about debating or public speaking to know that, like, saying uh is bad and don't, like, throw in a bunch of filler words, just start actually saying, like, the important words. And, like, you can practice that. And I'm not saying it's easy, but, like, he should know better. And he's been doing this kind of thing for a long time.
main is the individual is important because that's all we got, right? In a society, we got individuals. We can talk about society, society is just a collection of individuals. The starting point, both in ethics and in politics, has to be the unit of value, the unit that actually exists in ethics, the unit that exists, not the abstraction that we call state or society. What's important is... Like, how does this relate to what Jordan Peterson said? He's talking about individuals are important. Like, sure, objectivism's, objectivists are going to agree to that. Jordan Peterson fans are going to agree to that. But, like, he's not correcting Jordan Peterson in any clear way. Jordan Peterson didn't say individuals suck. Jordan Peterson did say some things that I heard as anti-individualist, where he said, like, you need responsibility so the state doesn't fall apart. That sounds like having duties to your government, um, like, inherently, which sounded nasty to me. That sounded like not, uh, not having a voluntary free society, including the government, even as an ideal. Like, Rand wanted, in the future, as an, as an ideal to work towards, to have a government that was voluntarily funded. So, like, not even taxes would be a duty. You would figure out some way to voluntarily finance the government and pay for the army and the police and the courts. And you would get rid of most of the rest of the government. Is the ability of the individual to live a good life, to take responsibility for his own life, for his own happiness, for his own success, for his own flourishing. So the individual is, is, is everything when it comes, in my view, in morality and in, in, the, in the extension in politics. I think rights are the concept that recognize that. It's, it's the bridge, right? It's the bridge between a morality that says your moral responsibility is to make the most of your life and then what kind of political system should we live in, should we live in to make that possible? And rights recognizes that the enemy of a good life, the enemy of flourishing, the enemy of success and living is coercion and force. It's, it's the group, the states, the, the community, other people, other individuals, coercing, uh, being a carrying over you, uh, telling you how you must live and how you must act. And rights recognize that as individuals, we have freedom. We must be free to use our own judgments to live our own lives as we see fit. And that's the great revolution of, of the Enlightenment, is, is the recognition of the sanctity of the individual and creating a political system that allows the individual to flourish and to thrive by protecting him for coercion, by protecting him for force, and, and relegating state to that duty. The responsibility of the state is to protect rights, to protect him from force. So it seems to me the battle between the individual and... So he, he did not clearly explain what that had to do with Peterson. He got to it a little bit when he said that like rights let you have a free life and then uh, you can take responsibility like within your life. I think it was roughly what he was trying to get at, which is not what Peterson said. But he didn't say like, you know, Peterson said this, I say this. Like he's not, you know, quoting and challenging. He's not directly disagreeing. Like people watching this are not going to know uh, that there was like a major disagreement here and that things Jordan Peterson said were actually really bad. Like he's not getting condemned. He's not getting judged. He's not getting, like, strongly or directly criticized. Why don't they write notes and be like, Jordan Peterson, you said this. Like, I seriously disagree with you about this. I think what you're doing is actually, like, harmful, dangerous, bad. Like, I think when you're spreading this message, like, some of your messages are good, but I think this one actually can destroy the world if everyone listens to you. So I think we have a major disagreement here, and I want to talk to you about it and, and try to figure out why you're saying this and if you really mean it. Like, he should say something like that, but he just doesn't. Not at all. Not even close. Collective is a battle that has been fought for virtually every society for all time. However, there does seem to me, at least maybe just because I'm alive right now and doing what I do, that there's something unique about the battle at the moment. That the individual has been slammed so relentlessly, and that we have ideas out there now that for, for young people that they think that socialism is cool. I mean, that seems to be coming back, right? I mean, these are, these are ideas that I think are really crazy, but I'm happy to indulge in, in the discussion about them. Do you think there's anything unique about the, the battle between uh, the individual and the collective right now, or is it just a repeating of what's going on? I think, I think, I think. What the hell? This is supposed to be a panel on, like, the role of philosophy in life. But we didn't start with that, and now the question is about are the young socialists and SJWs and whatever, like, uniquely bad? Are we at some, like, special moment in history? Or uh, has politics always sucked? Like, roughly that question. Like, what the hell? Why? Th this is... I mean, that's like a typical Jordan Peterson topic, but it's not how you demonstrate the value of objectivism and give objectivism the opportunity to present itself. I mean, there's always something unique about each historical moment, but I, I think this is I mean, this has been a continuous argument for the last 130 years like, as a technical philosophical argument, and of course it has roots that go back much farther than that. I, I don't see, I mean, it, it is collectivism versus individualism, I think, a fundamental polarizing force that's, 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 that's at work at the moment. And the issue with the collectivist types is whether or not they're collectivist because they care about the dispossessed, which is their fundamental claim, or whether they're collectivist because they don't want to bear any of the responsibility that would go along with being a responsible individual. And you know, I'm always skeptical of the of the saint like moral claims that are put forth by people who are pushing a given ideology. And I'm skeptical about that on my part, too. I mean, people who criticize my perspective say, look, Dr. Peterson, you're not or maybe they call me something all of us. Right? <laughs> you know, they say, you're not, you're not, um, you're, you're criticize my perspective, say, look, Dr. Peterson, you're not or maybe they call me something all of us. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm well, that my part too. The people who criticize my perspective say, "Look, Dr. Peterson, you're not," or maybe they call me something a lot less flattering. Than that. <laughs> oh, it's just like a side joke. Maybe they call me something a lot less flattering. No subtitles. You know, but you're not. Um, you're, you're, you're underestimating the degree to which systemic barriers make it impossible for people to move forward properly in the world. There's, there's barriers to the progress that people can make, even if they bear individual responsibility, and those barriers are distributed unequally. And of course, there's some truth in that because every system 
tends towards rigidity and tyranny, and no system does a perfect job of selecting among its people for pure competence. But there's a difference between saying that a system is somewhat corrupt, which is certainly the case with Western systems, and the system is an absolutely corrupt, tyrannical patriarchy with no hope of redemption whatsoever, it needs to be burned to the ground and reformulated. Those are really different. And you know, it's also possible to be sensible and say, well, look, I mean, obviously, the manner in which people are selected for success in our society is imperfect. Um, but also to know, well, imperfect compared to what exactly? Like to your hypothetical utopian perfection, which you would self-generate if you were given ultimate power, is that really a comparison? Or to our societies in the past, because we're doing a lot better now than we were, or compared to every other society that's ever existed since the dawn of time, by which standard we're doing so insanely well that it's actually almost unbelievable. And, and this is another thing that I've been trying to promote. I mean, there's been at least a dozen books written in the last six or seven years by fairly serious scholars, and I would say distributed across the, the, the political spectrum, pointing out that ever since the year 2000, things are getting better so fast that it's actually a miracle. You know, I can give you some quick facts. So the rate of absolute poverty in the world fell by, by 50% between the year 2000 and 2012. So that's a staggering achievement. It was three years faster than the most optimistic projections of the UN. So we actually beat an optimistic UN projection. So there are more, well, that's absolutely the only belief. There are more forests in, in Northern Hemisphere now than there were 100 years ago. Um, the child mortality rate in Africa is now lower than it was in Europe in 1950, which is just beyond belief. The fastest growing economies in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, about 300,000 people, can't remember if it's a day or a week, but it doesn't matter, although it would be better if it was a day, obviously, are being plugged into the electrical grid. So increasingly people have universal access to fresh water. There's almost no country in the world now where starvation is a problem that isn't just a political problem, which is to say we have enough food for everyone. And not only do we have enough food, we have the distribution systems that are actually getting enough food for everyone. It's absolutely beyond belief. And what's that's quite remarkable about that. It's quite obvious that individually, that, like that free market systems predicated on the idea of the sovereignty of the individual are the reason that that's happening. So, <laughs> so. Well, that was, that was standard Jordan Peterson. And it was okay. And he had some good points. There was some questionable stuff too. Like he sort of, he seems to think the UN would be a reasonable or even optimistic judge of the rate of capitalism improving the world. Whereas I would expect the UN to be kind of anti-capitalist and therefore to be completely able to underestimate uh, what capitalism will change and how fast it'll change it. So he's like, we beat the anti-capitalist projections of how much prog progress capitalism would make and he thinks that's like really good and impressive so he clearly like overvalues the un and has a a misguided perspective on them so there's, there's an opportunity here for someone to say you know this is you, you've shown how philosophy matters to life in your evaluation of the un that reflects on your philosophical errors that objectivism could correct and let me tell you how like someone could reply with that now but they're not going to like i, I would bet significant money that they're not going to reply that and this whole thing is just, it's not uh, how philosophy deals with life. Like, that was just standard Jordan Peterson talking his, his normal stuff. It's not, that wasn't him engaging with objectivism. The question is, what the hell are the collectivists up to? Why are they, <laughs> what's the problem here? What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? Oh my god, he's still talking. I thought it, I thought it was going to be done there when they started clapping. I, I thought someone else would start talking. But, like, they're just letting Jordan Peterson talk for so long. Like, he's dominating the discussion. He's coming off as, like, the important person. And then the other people say, like, me too, and add a... They're like, okay, okay, Jordan Peterson talked long enough. Guys, guys, your turn. Say something. Say something. Okay, good. Now, now it's a panel, and then Ruben talks again, and then Jordan Peterson gets gets to give another lecture. Like, the objectivists are coming off as like the sideshow, the side characters, and Jordan Peterson is the protagonist. That is like the format so far, and he's talking so long that it's really reinforcing that. And so they're not, they're not showing objectivism as this powerful force that can stand up to Jordan Peterson, that can challenge him, that can correct him, that can improve on what he said. They're presenting objectivism as uh, just some okay thing, and, and they can... Good enough to say me too after Jordan Peterson talks. There seems to be a certain amount of ignorance, a certain amount of willful blindness, and a certain amount of discomfort with the fact that a fair bit of that wealth has been purchased at the price of a continuing inequality. You don't know how to generate wealth without also generating inequality, and I actually don't think that you can generate wealth without generating inequality, and that's, well, that's something that's worth endlessly discussing. <laughs> I think I might have a little something to say about inequality. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I like to say in, in brief, right? Inequality is a feature of freedom, not a bug. It just comes. And now, like, before Yaron talked, he had to be, like, handed, like, the most blatant lead. And, like, Jordan Peterson just controlled what Yaron will talk about. Yaron isn't going to now, you know, argue about the UN or bring the discussion back on topic. He's just going to talk about inequality as a feature of capitalism. Like, Peterson's controlling the discussion and the narrative, and he's putting Yaron in Me Too mode, where Peterson brings it up, and Yaron gets to say, oh, I know that when I wrote a book, thanks for giving me an uh, easy one, I, I can talk now and, and actually get to say something. Like, Yaron does not look strong and powerful here. He looks like he's just getting handed crumbs. <laughs> And Peterson just baited him to agree. The orange were like, you're, you're actually right. It's, and 
Like, how dumb does Yaron Brook? He's like, Yaron Brook, look, he wrote a book so that he could say, yeah, Peterson, you're actually right. You, you didn't need to research it. You didn't need to write a book. You just knew that. And I've written a book, so I was able to, to agree with you. It's like, what's the point of being an intellectual? Like, uh, well, like a, a more scholarly intellectual or whatever Yaron Brook is supposed to be, like a philosopher. Is he a philosopher? Does he claim to be a philosopher? I mean, I think so, but I'm not sure. Like, what, what's the point of being an objectivist if you can just, like, write a book to figure out what Jordan Peterson knew anyways without being an objectivist? Like, that's not showing the value of objectivism. And it's... It's just, like, a... It's not that impressive of a point. Like, lots of people know about modern political debates about wealth inequality, and lots of right-wing people, even ones that aren't even that great on capitalism, are, are like, you know, we need some inequality. We need equality of opportunity equality of like uh under the law equality of like social mobility you know stuff like that not equality of outcome you don't have to be an objectivist to be like i don't support equality of outcome i don't want the government like redistributing wealth to make everything equal for a moment and then it'll change again as people some people consume more than others use their wealth less more or less wisely than others produce more than others etc but in a sense, he views that as a moral ideal. You can't get there, it's rough, it's a little too violent, it's too much life, it's tasty, it's after all, right? So... Why didn't these people just, like, watch some Jordan Peterson videos in advance of this, write down some quotes, and then go, go to Jordan and say, Hey Jordan, I'm, I'm really glad I got you here, because I disagree with some important things in your videos. Like, I, ma I made a list of, like, the top five things that are thematically appropriate that I really disagree with you about. And I want to ask you like why you believe them and, and tell you why I think they're really badly wrong. Like, why are they not bringing up anything important? This is so boring. So the equality is a nice disguise. So we want to reduce equality by the base of people who talk about equality. It's about how much? Well, well, we'll get it. Who will we get Who gets to decide? How do we get a vote? How much are we going to take? And why? Why just monitoring the vote? I mean, age building guy? It's not fair. <laughs> I don't know if they're either, they're either they're cowards or they just like Jordan Peterson and they don't really have a problem with him. Like, it's one of those. And, like, I sort of like Jordan Peterson. Like, I like some of his stuff. My favorite Jordan Peterson stuff is his psychology lectures. And in particular, his analysis of the Disney movies. Like, I think that Jung and his symbolism stuff is questionable when you analyze your dreams and try to, like, figure out how to live your life with it. But I think it's really good for analyzing art, um, you know, literature and movies and stuff. Because it is... Uh, symbols that have meaning in our culture so like artists use them and then you can understand what the artist meant better so like i think jungian stuff uh you know questionable in some contexts but great for analyzing disney movies and, and lots of other literature and art and stuff anyways but there's also there's seriously bad things about jordan peterson including like in his book he advocates violence against children so you know, the objectivist here could say, you know, I have a philosophy that is anti-violence in a consistent, principled way. So that led me to disagree with your advocacy of violence against children. And I understand how children learn because I have an epistemology, unlike you. So here's how children learn, and here's how violence disrupts that rather than aiding it. And here's why you shouldn't hate your children. You know, you could say, here's how I used philosophy to get these practical results and, and seriously disagree with you about something important. There's plenty of other topics. Like, he, he could disagree with Jordan Peterson about, like, antidepressants and serotonin and lobsters and dominance hierarchies. He could say, you know, I have a better philosophy than you, so I think I do. So I used it to criticize what you said about this. I, I fact-checked some of your research, and I found that your scholarship wasn't good enough. And I also, you know, found some logical flaws in your arguments. And I also... Um, Uh, have have a better view of how it works, like have have a positive view of how these things work that makes more sense and 
uh, more enables productive action than yours. And, you know, talk about that. And, and by the way, if you haven't seen it, I have four videos on the rule one of Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, on my YouTube channel. And... Uh, I, I go through some of the things I just talked about with like scholarship problems in the lobster section and uh, philosophical arguments about why his perspective is incorrect on some of it. And that chapter in particular is dehumanizing. Like it, it's overly comparing humans to lobsters. It's overly seeing humans and lobsters as similar. And, and so that's that's exactly the kind of thing objectivism should object to, take issue with, disagree with. Because objectivism is very, very pro-human and sees humans as like very important, powerful, meaningful, and is fully capable of drawing a major distinction between humans and lobsters that Jordan Peterson doesn't get. And so they could tell him that. They could say, like, that's one of our major disagreements. My philosophy helps me see it in a different way, and I think you're wrong. But they're not doing that. <laughs> It's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of explain that. And, 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 I mean, how do, how do we, how do we do that? How do we, you know, the experiment of trying to equal us, in a book we need an example, of course, of the tragedy of, of the whip tragedy of Cambodia and Cambodia, where they attempted to equal us, not just, not just on, on monetary issues, but on smarts, who will do that, still educated and smart. On, on every other factor, who's a good farmer, who's a good, good father for food, they killed all. 40% of the population is. So, uh, yeah, so the whole, I mean, I get, I get, we have separate people, even make an issue of equality, because it shouldn't be an issue of equality. And I think it's changed. I think in America, 50 years ago, and I'm trying to tell you, because I know they use that. It just, it, it wasn't this, like, no kid, right? Because it was a feeling, you know what it is? Well, there's also a feeling that, see, I'm not so sure people care as much about inequality as. And we're back to Jordan without Greg talking. And the way Greg is acting, Greg is the one in the middle here, by the way. Uh, there's no indication from Greg's behavior, as I see it, that he wants to talk, that he's like eager to challenge Peterson, that he wants to, uh, you know, say things. Like, it seems like he's just going to say things when it's his turn, and he, he doesn't really care. He doesn't have any energy or drive or whatever. Like, that's not how John Galt would act. If John Galt were here, he'd be leading the discussion, and he'd have important things to say. They care about inequalities of hypothetical trajectory. So meaning that it isn't so bad if you're rich and I'm poor, if I believe that if I put my best foot forward, I might also, my, my life will improve across time, or even find that my children's life will. Because I think people are more interested, I think people vote their dreams rather than their realities, and the dream has to be attacked. I do have a couple of, just one thing, I think that's true, but it's also true that people people resent wealth when they think it's unknown. Yeah, I think the more, the more we move towards uh, uh, a... So Yaron just managed to break in, but Greg hasn't. Like, Greg could have managed to break in by now if he wanted to. Like he hasn't talked for a long time. Especially the economy, the more we have chromium, and the more the real problems in the economy that we have, who don't have pure capitalism, then the more they're suspicious of the people at the top. Because indeed, they, they see the people at the top choosing the politicians, and that's what scares them. So I think America shifted partially because they're not sure the people own it. And partially because they're being with this message. You should envy them. It's, it's immoral inequality. So, so I think the combination, the combination of the dream, the justice of it, is it just for somebody to have, to have that wealth because they own it, and this issue of, of they just being shifted in morality in the, in the moral perception. I think we have a, we have. A... So Yaron broke in. Peterson, I think, is going to mostly ignore him and just go back to what Peterson wanted to say. What Yaron said was, like, not challenging to Peterson. It was just Yaron talking about his own stuff. Like, it's it's just like everyone's going to say their own things and, like, here are my great ideas. And that's not, like, they're not debating Peterson. They're not challenging Peterson as a flawed intellectual and, and trying to say objectivism is important to Peterson and Peterson ought to learn it and here are some of the differences it would make. Structural problem that's going to emerge too. That, and this is where I would take some issue, I suppose, with the with the idea that there's nothing intrinsically bad about inequality. I mean, because it, it presumes something approximating a level playing field. And I'm not thinking so much about systemic barriers. Well, let me just make the argument very briefly. Thank you. One of the things that. that... So now Peterson is going to sit on the objectivist stage, and rather than him getting challenged by objectivism, he's going to challenge objectivism. He's going to take the initiative and say, you know, I think you guys might be wrong when you uh, love inequality so much. And look at the issue Peterson picked, like. It's hard to find people who are just 100% like, oh, unlimited equality is, is good. So Peterson is going to come off as the total reasonable moderate who says, you know, you know, I'm not an anti-capitalist. Like, we need to have some wealth inequality, not just like socialist wealth redistribution. Like, read the Gulag Archipelago and educate yourselves. But that doesn't mean just like unlimited inequality is always good. That's what Peterson's going to say. And everyone's going to think he's reasonable. And objectivism is not going to, you know, gain new converts off this unless they suddenly start standing up to him way better than they have been. I spent a lot of time looking at the critics of success in, in, in Western, functional Western hierarchies. And, and Peterson is like so alpha and they're so beta because like, you know, they invited him to their conference and then he's the one who's going to challenge them and like open up a conflict with them. Whereas they did not 
in any clear and followed up on way, like argue with Peterson. Like they argued with him a little on his first comment, but they didn't make it really clear that they're arguing with him. And then Ruben just asked a new question and Peterson didn't reply to them. Like he didn't, he didn't come off as debated with. If he was debated with, like he didn't notice it, he didn't need to reply. And they didn't ask for replies. They didn't say, hey, wait, I was, I was arguing with you and you haven't replied. Let's go back. You know, they didn't do that. So they're, they're agreeing that what they said, like didn't need answering. But now Peterson's going to argue with them about inequality, and they're going to answer him. They're going to respond. They're going to be on the defensive and deal with Peterson's challenge. And, you know, the best that's going to happen, I predict, is that they're going to give some sort of answer, and Peterson is going to say, okay, that's sort of reasonable. I, I could see how, how you would think that way. Uh, I'll, I'll let you off the hook and not hate you. Like, you, you've passed my test that I don't think you're unreasonable. Like, maybe they'll they'll get, like, sort of sanctioned by Peterson when they respond to him. That's what I think might happen at best. Alternatively, that he it might just be left as like a disagreement and he'll he'll leave it as them looking bad. The two intrinsic psychological factors that predict success are intelligence, as you assess it with IQ tests, which is the best way to assess intelligence by, by, by an overwhelming margin, and trait conscientiousness, which is industriousness and orderliness, uh, sometimes known as grit. Um, and those are quite good predictors of long-term success. They account for about 40% of the variability across time, which leaves a lot of other... Peterson's lying, like I've looked at the research. What he's saying is not true. And that fits with his book where you check his sites and lots of them are not true. Um, IQ tests are uh, questionable predictors and the, the big five personality are much worse. And like he said 40%, but what he's doing there is he's combining like the IQ and the, the, the big five personality conscientiousness. Conscientiousness, it's like they've come up with numbers like 15% as, as the factor in special cases, not even in general. And then, you know, you hear 40 from him, but that's because he's adding an IQ, which is bigger. Factors to play. But there's something quite terrifying about the intelligence end of that uh, equation because IQ is. And those numbers are, are misleading. Like, basically, you have to square them and they, they get a lot smaller. Like the the math is misleading. I don't I don't think what he's saying is yeah. Basically, it's not true. This is not only distributed in population. There's incredible differences between people who are at the top of the IQ distribution and people who are at the bottom. Oh, if you want to know about that, go to my blog and click on uh, archives to get the different categories, and go to the Robert Spillane one. It might just be labeled Spillane. And uh, I've got I discussed that with him. I asked him about it because he he wrote books related to that, and I asked him where some of the details were. And he gave me some more info to look at, and I I investigated it a bit. Okay, I'll show you. So go to curie.us and then click archives. And then there's a Jordan Peterson one, by the way. So if you click on list, you'll see them. If you go to uh, commentary videos on 12 rules for life, then you can get links to all four of my videos. You can also find them on my YouTube channel directly. And these are uh, quite critical. Some of these other ones are friendly, like there's Disney movie stuff, although the uh, the antidepressants letter is also very critical. However, uh, here we go, Robert Spillane. Spillane. Uh, here we go. Comments on personality or performance, the case against personality testing and management. And I ask him about it. I say Peterson specifically says the big five personality traits plus IQ are the important ones. And he says blah, blah, blah. And so I wrote to Spillane about this. And Spillane answered and I looked into it more. See, update. Spillane comments on the big five in his book, Psycho Management and Australian Affair, and I've got these quotes. And the footnote. Uh, I looked into it. Splain seems to be factually correct. Jordan Peterson badly wrong. Yeah, I remember looking into this. It took me a while because the article had like a, a chart with data. 
And I was trying to figure out how they calculated some of the things or what they meant um, in order for the numbers to come out right and be like consistent with each other. Cause they didn't explain how the chart worked very well. So I had to try like calculating it like five different ways or something before I figure out what, what they were doing. Um, and then it made sense and it was correct. And I got the, the number they got and Oh, I, no, wait, that wasn't it. It, it was, um, it was Spillane cited something, but Spillane had done a calculation. So I had to figure out like how he had calculated something from the data in the, in the study. Oh, so part of the problem here is there's the hard criteria and the soft criteria. So like the hard criteria were like the real ones and the soft criteria were just sort of the like approximate squishy making stuff up crap. And they, they, they'd use soft criteria and get better numbers. And then when they actually like measured things in a way that was like more objective and you're just measuring hard numbers instead of like, you know, asking people like soft criteria would be like, you ask someone if they're good at something or you ask their boss if they're good at it. And hard numbers would be like, you know, instead of asking if they're good at sales, you just look at how many they sold. So when, when you look at the hard criteria, you're going to have less bias and then you just get smaller numbers. So when, when it's more biased, then uh, the personality things seem to matter more. Right, so 0.21, you have to square that. See, 0.21 doesn't mean it, it, it controls 25% or 21% of what's going on. It leaves 95.6% unaccounted for. In other words, you square it and you, you see that it accounts for 4% of what's going on. That's just because of how they do the math and stuff. So conscientiousness, but... Conscientiousness, like maybe you can get like a 0.21 and it's like 4%. But they, they do things like cheat with the soft criteria where they just ask people stuff instead of actually measuring things. And when you use the hard criteria, you get like half the results. So the average correlation between the big five and job performance, hard criteria, was 0.07 squared. So that's like 2%. 2% correlation. I wonder if that's a, a square or a footnote, actually. There's a period. But whatever, this, the squaring thing, like, you see it here, like, 0 0.21 and then you have 95.6. That's, that's because you have to square it. So the square of the correlation coefficient indicates the proportion of variation in job performance, which is accounted for by difference in personality scores. So like if the number was 0.9, that would be 81%, not 90%. And if it's 0.5, that would be 25%, not 50%. So if you want it to be like half of what's going on, you need a, you need a correlation number of 0.7. So the numbers like look bigger than they are. Anyway, um, I checked the math on this at the time. Like I, I looked into this in detail, how it works. Um, I looked at the original paper, like I checked all this stuff and I found that Spillane was correct. And, and Jordan Peterson himself has actually talked about the squaring thing. Like that's not controversial. See, soft criteria include ratings subjective ratings, basically like people, you know, self-evaluating things or evaluating other people. And hard criteria include things like productivity data, salary. So like, instead of just asking, hey, is he a good employee? Like you look at what his salary was and uh, how long he keeps a job without getting fired and how often he gets a promotion, you know, things like that. And you get better results that give half, half the correlation to personality tests. So yeah, Peterson is just not honest about this stuff. Like it's not just that he's incorrect and doesn't know the scholarship that well. Like he's presenting himself as an expert, not as a clueless novice who read a few things and like thought they were a big deal. Like he's saying like the science is in these, this is a science. And then he's misrepresenting the science like really badly. And like this study Spillane got his numbers from, like 
one of the things I noticed when I looked at it is it's it's on the same side as Peterson. Like it's pro psychology. It it was trying to say good things about personality tests. Um, but but Spillane was like, okay, you you're pro personality tests, but your data shows that they don't work very well. But the 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 study tried to spin it in like a positive light. And Spillane was completely right to be like, hey, wait, your own numbers are not so good. So the study people weren't that honest either. I can't believe how variable people are in their intelligence. It's quite staggering. Well, I can give you an example. So it's actually illegal in the United States to induct someone into their forces if they have IQ less than 83. And the reason for that is that their forces determined after 100 and some years of, of extraordinary rigorous testing, um, motivated by the hope that Everyone would be fodder for the armed forces. That's their whole right, because they have a chronic manpower shortage, peacetime and wartime. So they want people in the armed forces. They're not going to exclude them unless they have to. And the consequence of the analysis was that if you have an IQ of 83 or less, there isn't anything you can be trained to do in the armed forces that isn't positively counterproductive. It's like, yes, yes, and this is a way bigger fact than you think, because that's about 10% of the population. And so, so we have a problem, and I would say it's a problem that is, is going to manifest itself in something that approximates an inequality that looks unfair, because there are the cognitively dispossessed are going to have a very rough time competing there. We do. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And so, it, it, see, the problem with, with producing hierarchies and even allowing people to climb up hierarchies, response. Okay, so first of all, again, this is totally off topic. This is standard Jordan Peterson stuff. And it's so screwed up because he said, hey, you objectivists are wrong about inequality. But then he just started talking about this for a long time before they even replied. Like, he's tangenting so much, they might not even reply. But anyways, topically, the implication, the thing the audience is hearing, is that IQ is genetic, and 10% of people are born too stupid to be in the military without being counterproductive. And that's just like a, a biological fact about them that we as a society have to deal with. And one of the implications there probably is that, you know, we need massive charity or possibly government welfare for the 10% of the population who are just born stupid. And, you know, I don't think that's true. I think that they're, they're parented and, and taught by their teachers to be stupid. I don't think they're born stupid. And... I'm not going to have that debate right now, but I hope that uh, I hope the objectivists will bring it up because Ayn Rand said men are born tabula rasa, blank slate. Um, they're not born stupid; they are born with a with reason, with a reasoning faculty, and then the contents of their mind, like their beliefs, what ideas they have, are things they pick up later, and that's where they get the evasion, dishonesty, flaws, errors, etc. Like they're not born bad. So we'll we'll see if anyone uh, brings up the the disagreement. Is that the hierarchy still produces dispossession at the bottom, and we need to figure out how to deal with that. Even if the only consequence of that dispossession is the generation of envy, because envy can bring down. So he said we need to figure out how to deal with this. Like he he's treating it in a collectivist way. Like he said he was an individualist earlier, and he got applause. Um, I think. There was definitely talk of individualism that got applause, but some of that was Yaron. But I think Dort Peterson said some pro-individualist stuff. I know he has elsewhere. Uh, anyways. What he was just saying is that we need to deal with this problem. Like, he's treating society's problems in a collectivist way. Like, it's, it's seriously anti-individualist to be like, we as society have a problem and we as society, like, have to deal with this. And that kind of reasoning gets to government action, commonly. So I really hope the objectivists will say, like, hell no, but I don't think they're going to. The state. You might tell people, well, you have a moral responsibility, not to be envious. Fair enough, perhaps you do, but it isn't clear that that's going to be a sufficient solution to solve the problem. And we also have the cognitive problem that no one will talk about, and that we should talk about, because it's a real, it's real. So, so it sounds like we're talking about the same thing we're talking about. We should talk about it because it's real. Like, that's not an argument, that's just emphasis. There is a real problem there. I just d disagree about the nature of the problem and that it's genetic and inborn. But like, I do agree that for whatever reason, many adults are bad at thinking and sure, 10% of the population are quite bad at thinking and it's uh, problematically so. But I do not agree that, like, we as a society have to deal with a societal problem, like, in a collectivist way. I think, like, individuals should individually deal with 
aspects of the problem that touch their own lives. And, you know, some of them who are particularly interested in it might make foundations that try to deal with it or nonprofits or, or for profits or whatever. Like if you're going to, if you're going to help stupid people who can't have a productive life, there's a lot of profit to be made there if you can actually do a good job. But anyways, Peterson was saying that envy is not going to stop, or telling people not to be envious is not going to stop the bottom 10% from being jealous of the people with higher social status and, and causing problems, which, uh, you know, he doesn't say it, but that includes crime. Like, he's saying that these people are going to violate our rights if we don't help them. That's kind of the implication is we're held hostage by threat of crime, so we need to have government welfare to help them so they don't commit crimes against us. Like, it's actually appeasing violent thugs. But he doesn't say it that way. He left all that out, but that's what, he's, that's what he meant. That's what what he said means. So we'll see how the objectivists handle this. From a cognitive perspective or a financial perspective, that in terms of inequality, it's not really the... Wait, it's Ruben? Like, the objectivists aren't even answering him. No, 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 neither of them are jumping in and saying, like, you just said, like, five things like, that Ayn Rand's, like, rolling over in her grave, and maybe we shouldn't have even invited you here, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you straight now. The invited comment's bad. Like, they, they shouldn't say that, but, you know, there, there should be, like, a serious reaction here. Like, you just, you just challenged us. You just said that we're wrong to promote inequality so much. And then you were making collectivist statements and and uh, genes are destiny statements. And, you know, those are some three major anti-objectivist points. And now we just have Ruben talking and no rebuttal. All the people sort of bottom, it's the bottom of the bottom that can't help themselves. So it seems like maybe, well, what do you do about that? Well, one point that Rand made about this, and I think making this point is part of the solution to um, do people be envious, uh, letting people internalize this point, is that other people's goodness, other people's accomplishments, other people's intelligence, other people's wealth, if they've earned it, and a society that enables the most productive, smartest uh, people to achieve what they can achieve, is good for everyone, especially good for the people at the bottom of whatever hierarchy we might be talking about, of whatever level of ability, whatever level of money. And we can see that in even a little bit more freedom, a little bit more capitalism in countries like China and India has helped well, everyone there, but disproportionately the poorest people who started that, who had incredible incredible rates, and we were talking about this point, we've seen them go down. Uh, so I think envy, is, part of the cause of envy is, uh, wrong moral views that people have, moral views that hold that the purpose of someone's life isn't to achieve things in their own life, isn't to reach their own happiness, isn't to form a company like Microsoft and get a computer on every desk uh, in the world running Microsoft software. Uh, if someone does that, we think he's selfish, we think it's bad, or at least it's neutral. And we envy him and resent him. Uh, if we're brought up to think that way, or if we're brought up to appreciate the people who created this tremendous prosperity that we're talking about, and see that as morally good and as right, and as benefiting all of us, benefiting us not because they did it for us, but because um, taking responsibility for your life, having goals, having stuff you want that, like leading a life of your own on a grand scale, uh, for your own sake, is what benefits not only you, but makes you value everything else. If you have a society that understood that, I think that combats the envy. And one of the things that Rand wrote a really interesting article called The Age of Envy. So, so far, Greg is, first of all, not really cha challenging Peterson. And second of all, he's coming off as like naive and the loser of the debate because Peterson had just said, you know, we can tell people not to be envious and we can explain to them why it's not a good idea, but that's not going to stop. That's not going to convince all of them and we're still going to have a problem. And then Greg's like, well, here are some things we could tell them that we can tell the stupidest 10% of the population who can't even like do grunt work for the military. And we're just going to explain these intellectual arguments to them. Like, Greg comes off as totally impractical and missing the point of what Peterson was saying. Possibly because he is. Like, maybe he's just not very good. That talked about, um, and also another article, the untitled letter, which was a comment on Rawls. And she was very concerned about this kind of egalitarianism, this kind of growing nihilism and envy in the culture. Um, Wait, the untitled letter. Like, I know that chapter. Um, and it, it attacks uh, writers who write incomprehensibly to intimidate people. And, and the game where people pretend to understand it and praise it and, and won't admit the weakness of being confused. And, and the people who can understand it are like, this is trash and they don't want to deal with it. So there's no one to refute it. Um, it, it seems off topic. Like, I don't know why he, he brought that up. It, she couldn't American. It isn't the kind of thing. It was more characteristic of Europe in the 40s. It wasn't an American way of thing. It was catching on here. And I think she was prophetic. I think we're seeing a lot of that today. So let's shift a little bit because I know we can talk about it. That's it. That that little response of just about envy, and now Ruben, let's shift. So we, we got like a massive Jordan Peterson lecture. So it was like, okay, what's happened so far? It went Ruben Peterson, Greg Yeron, Ruben Peterson, Yeron, Peterson, Yeron, Peterson, and Greg, and then Peterson again. Or it, it, I'll bet you it's Peterson after Ruben. Like Peterson has been out talking the objectivists, like. I think he's talked more than both of them combined. Probably the individual and all that, we can do that all night long. But the, the title of this talk is Philosophy and the Human Soul. So we only talk... 
Right. So the objectivists are so low initiative. Like I was saying that they should be pushing the topic. It's their topic. It's good for them. And Ruben is just like, these people are so weak. I just talk about Jordan Peterson stuff as much as I want. And I hand him the discussion and they go along with it. And then when I want to cut them off, I'm like, hey guys, let's get back on topic. Like it's hilarious that he's using what should be a weapon against his side, the Peterson side, as a weapon against objectivism. That he's like, okay, let's let's bring it back on topic and just ignore what you just said. There's not going to be any rebuttal or going back and forth. But it wasn't very telling anyways. It doesn't really matter. Like it's not like it's not like Jordan Peterson would have had any difficulty responding to that. It it was like sort of agreeing with him and sort of not getting his point. So it'd be easy for Peterson to reply and either in a friendly way or even in a putting Greg down way. For literally about 20 seconds before us, before you know, we didn't plan anything about what we're going to do here. Um, so I thought the best way to start that would be, how would you even define the soul? Your honest, be. Really? <laughs> Wait, the soul. Oh, okay. So the, the topic I think was philosophy and the human soul. Like the, the, the screen at the beginning says something about how philosophy applies to human life, but I guess it's the soul. Okay, and now they just dump it on Europe. Wait. Um, so I thought the, the best way to start that would be, how would you even define the soul? You know, I'll start with you. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a psychologist. I'm a philosopher. I'm a funny Oh, Yaren's just putting himself down as someone who doesn't know about souls. He says he's a finance guy? Like, is that what he just said? <laughs> oh, so Greg is a philosopher, but Yaron views himself as a finance guy. And he's like, why are you asking me about souls? You're a fucking objectivist. Shouldn't you know this stuff? Like, aren't you? why are you on the panel if you don't know philosophy stuff? You're, he's a representative of objectivism. He should know objectivist philosophy and be able to handle things like this. And he's just laughing about it. And and he's so beta. Like He's he's just like, Ruben's in charge of the conversation and gets to decide when I talk and what I talk about. Like He's so controlled. He's such a lapdog. It's pathetic. And it makes him look super weak. Like People watching this are not like, wow, objectivist creates really strong firebrands who stand out even more than Jordan Peterson. It's Objectivism might be a decent philosophy, it's got some of the right ideas, but Jordan Peterson's like way cooler, way way stands out more, has more fire in him, like objectivism is too stuffy. That's the impression that Jordan Peterson fans are getting. Like objectivism is not selling itself, and it's not standing up to Peterson intellectually. Like it hasn't, you, you know, they haven't been like, okay, I've taken notes on what you said, Peterson, I'm now going to quote you and respond. Like it's not, it's not doing the intellectual thing and it's not doing the social thing. Neither one is going well. I was actually going to start with Jordan, but you look down for a second. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't have, I don't have a, a secret. <laughs> Ruben was going to start with Jordan. <laughs> That's hilarious. Like, he was just going to have Jordan talk more. I was actually going to start with Jordan, but you look down for a second. Yeah, you, yeah. 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 He, he literally just, like, Jordan just passed. Like, Jordan looked, Jordan heard Soul and, like, didn't know what to say and looked down, maybe. <laughs> or it could have been a coincidence. I don't know. So Ruben was just planning to like have Jordan talk more. <laughs> and and like the social dynamics are like Ruben sucking up to Peterson and everyone's fine with that and just laughing about it. I mean, I don't have I don't have a specific definition of it, but it has to do with, with consciousness and values. It has to do with, with, with our conscious experiences, some of our conscious experiences uh, of being again, and the values that we have as individuals, things that are most important to us and that. Yaron really likes like moving his hands while he talks. I think experience. Is what I would prefer as our soul, or our spirit. You know, I think it's somebody changeable. When I talk about spiritual experiences, it's, just, it's an experience of consciousness. It's a, you know, if you listen to a piece of music and, and the combination of emotion, values, and, and your conscious listening and, and absorbing, that to me is what spirit, soul would mean. Yeah, I would say. Um, speaking of the doctrine, further... was he not prepared? Like he knew what the topic was supposed to be. Why? Why didn't he prepare something better? Like that was just boring. He didn't have anything important to say. She had the, the phrase that man is being a self-made soul. So the idea here is your soul is your consciousness. Um, as a... This sounds prepared. This sounds like Greg actually knows what he's going to say. But Yaron like just didn't even prepare like a standard objectivist little mini speech on this. The faculty, your ability to know to think, uh, but also you have to build who you are, build your character, build your personality, build your values, come to value things, set your life around them by doing that over time and pursuing them. You develop a character, you develop a certain type of person, you develop a distinct individual. There's a, a beautiful line in the, in the Head, um, which is the same of this conference. Uh, someone... By the way, the the view that man is a being of self made soul contradicts Jordan Peterson's view that ten percent of people are just born stupid with bad genes that give them low IQs so low that they can't do anything productive, basically. But, like, they they don't notice when they're contradicting Peterson, or they're scared to contradict him, or something. I don't know. 
talks about how most people long for uh, mortality. When you meet them next time, they weren't the same as they were the last. They're mutable, they're constantly changing, but the after changes. But the hero of the novel, Dave says, you can imagine him existing forever. He's achieved mortality in his you know, day-to-day life because there's a constancy to him. And that kind of constancy, that having a soul, having an eye, being a particular person, it's an achievement. It's an achievement of having formed values, having formed something you want after life, and then having built for yourself through living life. The character that's adapted to that, the character that's focused on that. You know, this reminds me of uh, Groundhog Day, anyway, because in the few days we've been doing for the last couple months, a couple times it's come up as your favorite comedy, and you mentioned Groundhog Day, where he has to come back and do it better, and do it better, and do it better, and do it better. Now I set you up. What is your <laughs> definition of well, the soul? Well, I was thinking that the words, the hand that writes and then moves on, came into my mind, and then I was thinking, well, this is the way I conceptualize how consciousness works, and so maybe this is, in some sense, the locale of the soul. So I don't believe that we're driven deterministically, like obviously we are to some degree, but I don't think that that's the right way of conceptualizing how human consciousness works. I think it's putting the cart before the horse in some sense. So the way it looks to me is that what we have arrayed in front of us is a landscape of possibility. And that it so Jordan Peterson, right now, what he's doing is presenting himself as super smart. He's presenting himself as having such deep ideas that they're hard to share with people. He's, he's, he's not doing this directly. He's not saying it, but it's what he is signaling is his ideas are so deep and so big and complicated and advanced that it's really hard to share them with lay people like in the audience. But he'll try and he'll give you a taste of them, but it's not going to be the full thing because he knows so much. And the objectivists didn't do that. Like Peterson is posturing in like a major way here. I think that that's phenomenologically uh, accurate. You know, when you wake up in the morning, especially when you wake up at three in the morning, and you're, you're concerned about how your life is going, you see an array of possible futures manifest themselves in front of you. And, you know, there are more possible futures, of course, than you can imagine, but there's plenty that make themselves manifest. I could do this, I could do that, this could happen, what about this, maybe I should do this. And it's like there's a branching landscape in front of you, some of the places that you're headed to are more... Peterson's using his hands right now, but I don't think he's been doing it, like, as often as Brooke was. And Peterson, every gesture there, like, made sense to me, but when Brooke was gesturing, it was just like he was just words gestures words like i didn't see clear points to particular gestures peter's actually peterson right now is actually illustrating what he's talking about with the gestures it's better he's better at it it's like an example of a way that he's a better speaker likely than others and some of them take a lot more effort to attain than others but it's a distribution of possible landscapes and that's actually the reality it's not like you're driven deterministically by the present you see a, a branching landscape of possibility in front of you i think of that as potential and we all know about potential because we upgrade ourselves and each other for not living up to our potential which is a very interesting thing that we do because potential isn't something concrete in fact it's the opposite of concrete and yet we act as if it's the most real thing you should live up to your potential you know and your conscience will bother you if you don't live up to your potential so you have a potential and there's a potential that manifests itself and then what you seem to do is that you make choices between those alternative realities and you do that in part by imposing a value structure on them and, and, and deriving a pathway as a consequence of that but you decide which of those potentials are going to manifest themselves in actuality so you are the hand that writes it and then moves on and this is a very deep idea i mean i trace it back to, to i think our most profound religious intuitions um, the idea that, that was the word of god for example that gave rise to habit of order of the chaos at the beginning of time i think it's a reflection of the same idea i think the soul is the thing that mediates between potential and actuality and i mean that literally and metaphorically at the same time that's what you're doing is you're confronting potential which is that i mean that literally and metaphorically at the same time <laughs> which could whatever. be whatever and you're deciding which of that is going to be and the thing that's doing that is the soul and that's its divine task and i think the fact that you do that is actually why it's necessary for societies to grant you the idea of intrinsic right sorry no that's why it's necessary for functional societies to be predicated on the idea that you have intrinsic value is because you actually are the locale where potential transforms itself into actuality and so when he corrects himself it's more posturing like that's not just an error like He's done a lot to polish how he speaks, and I don't think that's just like a random error. I think that having the occasional like self-correction is a way of signaling that you're explaining things that are very hard, and you're paying attention to whether you're getting it right. And like it, it gives a, a greater impression that he knows whether what he's saying is right or not, and, and he's you know aware of the truth, and so he corrected something. And, like, he's so smart that he saw a correction you didn't see. It, it helps with the, the presentation in a way. Socially. We determine the, actual, the action of our soul determines the actuality of the world. I think that's genuinely the case. So, so this is really interesting to me because I'm watching you guys. I can see a lot of agreement. But obviously Jordan made at least two references to God and religion. So Reuben, Reuben sees agreement. Like, Reuben is now going to bring up, hey, don't you objectivists disagree with religion stuff? The objectivists are so passive. Also, Jordan Peterson just gave like a, a speech that had nothing to do with uh, man as a self-made soul, like the objectivist stuff. He's not engaging with objectivism. He was just saying his normal things. And that, that speech just then was like, I don't think it was good. I don't think it was very coherent or meaningful. I think he was just saying a bunch of fancy words. Like I, I tuned some of it out. I got bored. Because I, I don't think that there was much of a point to it. Like, that was not, like, the, the serious written version, and I don't think the serious written version that actually really makes sense exists. Like, I, don't, I have a serious judgment of the matter, and uh, I'm going to move on, though. Now, obviously, this is where an objectivist and Jordan would have a point of disagreement. This is why we're doing these public events with Sam Harris. And one of the things I've been thinking about it as we've been on tour is at the end of the day, if we all ultimately agree, and if everyone in this room, if we could ultimately agree on morality and, and the definition of a soul that all made sense, and Jordan perhaps was, had more religious connotation and yours didn't, and we all could live functioning good lives within that, then does it really matter beyond the, the interest in the intellectual discussion? Because there's a lot of agreement. I can see it in your body language, in both of you guys. Right, I'll start with you. Well, please. <laughs> 
I think Reuben's right that he's seen agreement in their body languages. Oh, by the way, like, look at Yaron Brook, um, like, leaning forward. He's done that multiple times. Like, he's, uh, he's off on the edge. He leans forward. Like, he looks weaker than the other people, just overall in general when you see him, uh, in terms of body language. Which is what happened with uh, Ankar Gatte in the, the previous video with Peterson, Ruben, and Gatte. Is uh, Gatte had by far the weakest body language. Greg's been fine, though. Greg's been sitting back, and he's in the middle, and uh, has a crossed leg, and it's, it's fine. But anyways, again, like, instead of, like, Peterson running from debate, the, the impression you get here is, like, the objectivist, like, Ruben had to prompt the objectivist to actually disagree with something. Ruben's like, well, I see you guys, like, nodding along and having a green body language, but don't you at least disagree with religion? Come on, you're objectivist. Like, he has to prod them to, like, have any fire or spirit or challenge to them. And it, it makes them, it makes it look like objectivism is the, the side that's scared of debate or avoiding debate, and that Peterson has nothing to fear from them. Which one of the things I agree with a lot, and including some of these religious languages, there's a good reason for it. Even if you're religious, I don't think you're religious, and I think I'm religious, maybe. But, um, though I know you uh, interpret that very different. Um, but, um, so first of all, I think what we've seen, what you're describing about the many uh, manifold potential in this whole actualizer is a condition which I very much agree with, and I think you know is true, and I think that we'd be presupposed in all of our thinking over identity. So, agree, agree, agree. Boring. Which is that we have people. There's not a future that's written and we're just on a path traveling down it, but rather in every moment we're able to make choices and our choices change the future. And that is a really profound fact. Uh, it's a profound fact about our consciousness. It's connected to everything else that's value about us. And I agree that wasn't true of us. We'd be a very different kind of creature. We wouldn't interact with each other in the same way. We wouldn't need the same kind of political structure. And it's, it's such a profound fact about us that we don't really have language for it, or very good language for it. Um, religion has been the form in which people have. It's such a profound fact that we don't have very good language for it. That's fucking nonsense. Like, the profundity does not prevent language. Like, there are profound things that we do have language for. This is just something that our culture is a bit confused about, so the language isn't great. Like The language isn't great because there's misunderstandings about it. But you can have profound things that people understand well, and then the language is fine. It's all about the most profound facts, about the most profound experiences, about their understandings of them from, well, from as long as there's been people, as long as there's been for a very, very long time. Um, and the, the, as we've lost religion, um, we haven't found ways, or haven't always found ways, to conceptualize independently of religion um, those kinds of profound values, the profound role of freedom in human life, the, um, what our highest potential is. And so if you're going to talk about those things, it's very hard to do it without really, uh, reaching for uh, at least religious metaphor. Um, yeah, that's a really crucial issue, you know, I think. I think it's a fundamentally crucial issue. But I want to say, though, because... Is he going to disagree, though, about, like, God at all? <laughs> what's true? What's true matters, right? And something can be a beautiful metaphor, but if understood literally, it's false. And one of the things I think we need to do to uh, lead our lives well, to achieve these kinds of values, is to really value our minds and value our reason and value getting at the truth. So if it turns out that something's false, um, then believing that it's true is not going to make our lives better. And um, so I don't think it can turn out that we're going to have a very deep disagreement about what's true about the basic fact of reality, and yet we're all going to be on everything else. I think those two things will make a difference. But we have to acknowledge the role of consciousness and freedom, and I think there's an agreement between us on that. And well, well, he didn't even say, and God's existence is false, or something like that. Like, it's. He was prompted to disagree, and he, he was very vague about what the disagreement was. But I've observed, is, for example, in my clinical practice, when I'm talking about life and death, moral issues, and, and these are situations where extreme things are happening in families and, and individual lives, I'm talking about events that might produce post-traumatic stress disorder, or that set people up for murder at times of suicide, like, um, or terrible suffering, some of which is induced voluntarily, the probability that I can have a discussion with my clients about that at a level that will be salutary without using religious slash metaphorical language is zero. I can't, if I can't, if the discussion can't take place in the domain of good versus evil, something like that, and this is especially true, I would say, for post-traumatic stress disorder, you just don't get anywhere with it. And I've been thinking about the, 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 the narrative issue a lot, constantly, and I think that, I know we need to use, this, this is one of the weaknesses of the rationalist argument, I think, <clears throat> is that we have to use heuristics to operate in the world, so heuristics are, are simplifying numbers. And we, there's no... So part of the frame of the discussion is that everyone cares what Jordan Peterson has thought about, and, like, how his life goes, and his stories. But no one cares about that for the objectivists, like, they're non-entities. Like, everyone in the discussion is taking that for granted. Jordan Peterson is the only one who says much about like personal stories like greg will s tell stories about like ayn rand but not himself peterson will just talk about himself and like everyone is accepting of that framing that jordan peterson is the important person who's like worth being talked about and the other ones aren't and it's it's terrible to invite him to the objectivist conference that's supposed to offer total immersion and objectivism and then just get dominated by this non-objectivist. Like, they, they look like fools to have done this. Watch it. You have to use heuristics, and the reason for that is because there's a lot more world than there is of you. And so you take this incredibly complex reality, and you simplify it. And now the simplifications have to have merit, and, and what makes them have merit is, is grounds for a, is a topic for a very long lengthy discussion. But to produce those simplifications, you have to use heuristics. You have to use cognitive shortcuts. And it looks to me like narrative is a heuristic, and that 
the reason that we need to tell stories and that we probably need to have our ethic grounded in stories is because you can't make a list of rules that will tell you how to live. Rules don't suffice, but you can tell stories that are that lay out broad principles, and those are heuristic principles. Now, but the thing is that the most fundamental stories seem to have a religious core. Now, I'm not exactly sure why that is, although I think it probably has to do with something I referred to earlier, which is the idea that you know you are as a soul, you're the thing that transforms potentially into actuality. That seems to be the grounding concept in some sense. So that's the grounding concept. There's something divine about that. Out of that arises a sequence of, of stories that are shaped across perhaps evolutionary history, and inside that are more articulated ethic exists. And I don't see a way out of that because you cannot make an exhaustive list of rules that enable ethical movement forward. And you need to do that if you have a purely rational view of the way that human cognition functions. Right. Like so let's pause right there. Can either one of you figure out a way out of that? I mean, that, right, that would be the, the answer that objection we want to have, right? Here we go. We got a whole bunch of right here. <laughs> so. I don't think you can have a list of rules if the rule means something algorithm that's your life. Exactly. And I think that's just not something we can do. That's not the way the human mind works in the world. is complicated. And you're not going to get a bunch of Zen statements that take you, uh, take you to... I mean, you can't even do that for a physical system, too. Right, right. Um, but I think we can understand them rationally. It's, you know, this might be similar to what we're talking about in the dream about. Sam, your reason and your mind, you might figure out where they all uh, fly. But... I don't think reason is just about coming up with algorithms. I think we come up with concepts. Concepts enable us to assimilate vast quantities of similar things to one another and uh, learn from future instances, about future instances from past ones. We can get quite subtle um, principles. But I think moral principles are not things that take the form of simple rules. Don't lie. They're um, to take Rand's version of the virtue of honesty. Just don't lie. It's um, it's your recognition of the fact that what's unreal is unreal and can't be evaluated. So faking things won't work. It won't make them real somehow. The thing you say is going to come back to you. That's not a, a simple rule. Of what to do in the situation? It's a kind of broad fact that you can use to steer your life by. And in order to use it to your life, I fully understand it. You need to think about how it plays out in a lot of different contexts, right? You need to think about what it really means in practice. And art, uh, stories, but you know, literature, but also other forms of art, I think, are an indispensable means of doing this, both with ethical truths like this, and also with other uh, metaphysical truths, you know, what kind of world we're in. So I guess part of the, part of the discussion has progressed. So that was good. That, like, Greg is okay sometimes. Like, that was a decent speech about objectivism. You, you could tell that he, like, knows some of Rand's ideas, and, and he said them in a reasonable way. Like, I, I think maybe overall, like, the things Greg has said have been the best, but he's not standing out and he's talking way less than Peterson. Like, and I don't think Peterson's going to see the importance of that or, or find it, like, like, Peterson probably already knew some of that anyways. I don't think it's, like, really going to impress people that much. Like, it was... He just said some reasonable things, and that's going to move on. Obviously, I'm not an enemy of reason by any stretch of the imagination, but... Like, Greg wouldn't have dared to call you an enemy of reason. Why are you defending against it? I mean, well, he's... He's more praising himself as pro reason. It's hard for people who promote reason as the fundamental mechanism to distinguish between reason and the generation of algorithms. Like, and you can say, well, my concept of reason extends beyond the generation of algorithms. That's fine. But then my question would be, well, exactly what are the mechanisms by which reason functions when what it's doing isn't generating algorithms? Because algorithms aren't enough, and we know that, right? Which is why we have expert diagnostic systems, for example. So then the, the reason starts to look something like metaphor, it starts to look something like narrative, and then I start thinking, yeah, that's not exactly the enlightenment concept of reason. So we're starting to move into a, a different domain. And so. <laughs> more... I, I wonder what Peterson thinks the enlightenment concept of reason is. Where, where on earth does he get the idea of the enlightenment concept of reason is that people think algorithmically and metaphors are irrational? Anyway, I have the answer to this, but it's not objectivist. The, the proper conception of reason is error correction. Um, methods of thinking that enable, allow, facilitate error correction are rational, and things that block and sabotage error correction are irrational. They stay wrong instead of making progress. But uh, you don't you don't need to know that to answer this. Like the objectivist or enlightenment conception, I think, is that like reason is our our way of thinking to try to get at the truth, um, using things like logic and arguments. But in arguments, like you know, when you debate, it's not formulaic. Sometimes it is, but often it isn't. Like you don't just debate with an algorithm. You put creative thought into it, into thinking of arguments for different sides. So. Uh, so reason is not, like, tied to algorithm. It's trying to use logic, argument, um, careful, correct, truth-seeking thinking instead of bias, superstition, imagination, making things up. Um, and, like, other methods that are not truth-seeking. Than just algorithms and metaphor and narrative. First of all, one thing reason can do is come up with metaphors and narratives, but there's more than just those three things. There's also things of the formation of abstract principles. I don't think what Newton did in writing the Principia was coming up with algorithms. There are algorithms in it, but, or things we can algorithmize about proofs and things, but the act of forming the concept of inertia, that's not exactly. That's something else. And I think the, the inertia might be an algorithm. Yeah, but, but the, the act of coming up with it, exactly. Yes. And I think there's a, a whole and underexplored area of philosophy and cognitive psychology thinking about what are these acts of reason? How does reason function? How is it that we can go from the kind of information we have in perception to a more and more sophisticated understanding of the world? And um, I've written some on this, other people have, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how much you should try to here, but I can plug, uh, I have a chapter called Conceptualization and Investigation in a book called Concept and the Knowledge, my sense of what reason is. Greg is, like, so shy to, like, mention his own work. Like, he doesn't think he matters very much. But Peterson's not shy at all to mention his own stuff. Like, you can see the difference that, like, Greg thinks Peterson is more important than him or he's acting like it. 
Like th that's the general impression people are going to get. Which, which is not how you spread objectivism. It's not how you bring Jordan here to promote objectivism. Like the way you promote objectivism is you bring Jordan here and then you put on stage with him objectivists who you say, you know, our objectivists used objectivism to be better than you and more important than you and have better ideas than you and do better work than you and stand out more than you. You know, but they're not doing that. They're just putting these passive people who don't stand out on the stage with Jordan. And Jordan is talking more than both of them combined and not really being challenged and talking about a lot of his normal stuff. And like, where's the power of objectivism? Where's the demonstration? Greg's like, oh, I did write a bit about this in my book. And I don't even know if I should mention myself. Like, I want to I want to see those exact words. I have a chapter called Pinterest. I don't know how much you should have been here, but I can plug. I have a chapter. I want to hear the exact words. I should try to explain here, but I can plug uh, some on this. Other people have. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much I should try to explain here, but I can plug. Uh, I don't. I don't know how much I should try to explain here, but I can plug. Uh, I. I don't know how much I should try to explain here, but I can plug. I have a chapter. Okay. So he's just like I shouldn't talk too much. So I guess I can plug my chapter. It, it wasn't. It wasn't confident. It wasn't alpha. So. Like, Greg doesn't just go off on mini lectures. He's like, I shouldn't talk too much. Like, I'll just mention my book chapter because no one cares. And then Peterson's just like, I'll just talk about Roombas a bunch. Like, I'll talk about whatever the fuck I want. Everyone wants to hear me. Like, he's so confident. Disembodied reason, which is also, I would say, the latent concept seems to be lacking. It's lacking in functionality. You have to be embodied. And the thing to me is that an embodied reason looks to me a lot more like the hero of a story than it looks like disembodied reason. I think, I think that's a better... And this is, again, it's more Peterson challenging objectivism than vice versa. Like... There's, there's more like aggression on the Peterson side. There's more uh, challenge to it. So partly why I like the idea of the logos, for example, rather than the idea of reason, because and, and this is partly reflected in, in its conceptual Christian origins, because the logos in Christianity is something that's actually embodied, right? It's the word made flesh. There's a, there's, a, there's a link between the rational logos logic and the thing that's embodied, and it's the interaction between those two that produces, I think, produces that phenomenon that you described as what drove uh, Newton, for example, when he was producing his algorithms. That's not an algorithm. It's something else, but it's not. This, it's certainly not disembodied reason. But even that metaphor, of the word made. It's certainly not disembodied reason. Like objectivism is just wrong about reason. That's kind of what he's saying. And the, the response is going to be completely passive and not contradictive and say it absolutely is disembodied reason or something. I mean, that's that's like an awkward way to say it. But, but like, if, if you... I think that you could program an AI in a computer, like a real AI that's like a person, and it could have no body, and it could think. I don't think a, bo a body is a requirement of thinking. So I, I think Peterson is incorrect, and like his example with the Roomba, I think is incorrect. I don't think like putting it in a body that like uh, wanders around on the floor like a Roomba and bumps into the walls and stuff. I don't think that makes it more intelligent. Like I don't think that's you know a significant source of greater intelligence, and that that's like the direction that AI research should be going. So I think Peterson's incorrect, but he's he's being challenging and aggressive about it, and. The objectivism people are just not going to say much. It sounds as though something that could have been disembodied was disembodied once, and now we got in mind. And so it still sounds to me a little bit too much like this uh, disembodied conception of what reason or mind. Um, whereas I think we want a conception of what reason is and what it does that involves the fact from the start that there's a, a feature of certain organisms. Uh, these organisms have perceptual systems, those are bodily anything is. And it's um, a, a faculty of integrating the data that's coming through those, uh, those organs, helping us direct ourselves through the world, uh, and then on a rendering render scale. But I, I do think in the Enlightenment, what we're getting is a lot of reflection for the first time, or for one of the first time, a renewed reflection on reason, what it is, how it works. And there are several different views, right? Some more materialistic views, like a whole lot and so forth, and then these more um, Cartesian type views. And I think most of the views that came out of that are wrong. I think it's, it's sad because it's a period where people really valuing the mind. Well, they're 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 so Greg actually knows like different enlightenment views on reason, but he doesn't really talk about them. He mentioned Holbach and uh, Descartes, but but he's like not going to go into it. Like he he could actually outdo Peterson here if he challenged him. I think I, I bet you that that Greg knows this stuff better than Jordan, 
and that if they started going into details on like what enlightenment thinkers said what and what were the actual movements and so on um like greg as a professional philosopher and might be able to challenge him here but that's just not going to happen idea of reason per se is that it's, it's not a sufficiently differentiated idea to account for how these actually operate in the world and so and, and, and... i mean of course reason just like we use reason doesn't explain like how we think like figuring out how reason works is part of the issue it's it's a it's like a very broad label like intelligence we use intelligence like you need a word for that but it's not the explanation of how intelligence works um but objectivism has an explanation of this it has a whole theory of concept formation and integration and like you can read introduction to objectivist epistemology and you can get like an actual theory about how reason works and you know it gives a big role to measurement emission and it goes over various things and, and you can find out Rand's view on this and you know objectivism has a view on this did he say facts from values Facts from values. He reversed it. He meant values from facts. Yaren like almost jumped out of his chair, but he's just like quietly waiting there for Ruben to say, "Oh, uh, Yaren raised his hand. I, let me just throw in a few more sentences, and then I'll let him talk." This is, this is a, the, the issue, right? So I have agreements with Sam on stuff for different, but we have different reasons for having an agreement. Uh, and so, for example, I agree with him in his art, but his conception of his art is very different than the conception of his art. And he has no free will in that conception, so that blows my mind. I can talk about his art and values without having free will, and, and, and he talks about choices without free will, which, which, uh, which is challenging. Um, <laughs> This is so weak. He's just like, we're going to have different opinions watching lots of Jordan stuff. Stuff, there's like topics like Jesus and sacrifice where we disagree and he doesn't say like what Jordan Peterson's view is or why he disagrees with it like he's not actually getting into the disagreements he's just saying they exist and moving on same way and say, okay, we agree on this stuff, but no, these, these things have profound consequences. Disagreements have uh, profound, uh, profound consequences. Now, when I think of my psychologist, I don't think of it as this, as this and again, I'm not, not a philosopher, psychologist, this is the way a layman in these terms would think. I think of my, uh, my psychologist, uh, my psychologist, a 99% off. He's like insulting himself, like talking about being a layman, instead of saying, like, you know, I'm such a powerful thinker, thanks to objectivism, that I actually know stuff about this. And I, I think even I can challenge you in your field because objectivism is so powerful that it's like worth more than a bunch of field expertise like why doesn't he say that i mean maybe it's not true for him but it's true for me and i, I think that's how objectivism should work and i think it was true for rand i think that you know rand was such a good general thinker thanks to objectivism that she could go into other fields like psychology and and get things right and say important things and correct people who are experts in that field I think it's, it's, it's something that accumulated information, conclusions, uh, values, uh, uh, decisions uh, that I made over such since before I was completely conscious of them. That they, I have access to some of them, uh, you know, hopefully cognitive psychology and help me get access to more of them. But they're accessible to me, they're not some mystery, they're accessible to me. And that when I'm making a decision in life, uh, I try to make it based on what I know, not based on... I, I think he's wrong. He says, like, that the stuff in his mind is accessible to him, not a mystery. Like, 
yeah, I think he's just wrong. I, I don't think he actually has access to most of the contents of his mind. I don't think I do. That doesn't mean it's, like, completely out of my control or hopeless, but, like... Like, if, if, if there's a problem in an area, then I can start, like, researching that area and find out more about it. It's not like, it's not like it's out of reach, but I can't just access it, like, automatically. Like, it, it takes an effort to figure out what's going on there. And the, the, like, the lower level it is, the more out of reach, because there's, like, many layers of the mind. And the further you get away from the conscious layer, then the harder it is to, like, put it into conscious terms. It doesn't mean, like, that there can't be any repairs done, but, like, uh, they're, they're, it's sort of like you need delegation. It's like the conscious mind is like on level 50 of the structure of the mind. And if you need to do repairs on level three, like it's too far away. The conscious mind like, you know, researches what's going on on level 25 and then tells tells the ideas there, hey, you need to make these repairs lower down. And then the ideas on level 25 go and interact with level three and fix it. And maybe there's like multiple steps of... Uh, of sending a message on to the next layer. But that that's different than actually like, you know, putting level three stuff into English so my conscious mind can think about it. So anyways, yeah, I think I think Yaron Brook is just going to lose this debate and like the thing he wanted to jump out of his chair about and make a big deal out of, I think he's just doesn't know what he's talking about very much. And he even said he doesn't know what he's talking about very much. And like, and I, the thing he's wrong about, I don't think it's an objectivist view. I don't think Rand wrote that. He's just saying stuff like, "Why not focus on objectivism more?" Well, I don't know the fact, right? So I try to know really the facts, just to find it. I need to the reality. I try to know really the facts and, and and integrate them, and, and try to distinguish between what facts are different, which facts are different. I try to integrate them and, and try to make decisions based on logic, based on based on reality. And you know, sometimes I will say, "This is conscious speaking." Uh, don't do that, or that's a bad thing. But so what? Right? If, if reality and facts are both real, no, that's conscious. So I don't see us as we got. It was very anti-emotional. I, I think that's like not the right way to view it. If your emotion disagrees, you shouldn't say, so what? You should say, as Rand did, my emotions are uh, like shortcuts to understanding my values. Like they're automated, quick thinking that gives me a lightning fast evaluation of something. So I, I know what I think about it without having to go through the whole uh, thinking it out from first principles view. It's You need... Uh, to have lots of your ideas, like uh, a short shortcut, a quick version of them, so that you have like freed up attention for other things. And so your emotions are that. So when your emotion says something's wrong, um, that's like representative of some larger structure in your mind thinking it's wrong. It's not just like some random stray emotion. Like there's there's something going on in, in how you see the world. There's some like disagreement within yourself. If you are consciously disagreeing with your emotion, then the emotion is not just this this random minor thing that's all by itself isolated and has no real meaning. Like your emotion was created by you integrating other ideas you have to be able to more quickly uh, give give answers, but with less explanation. And so you shouldn't ignore that. You should you should look into it. Like try to figure out what's going on. It's it's true that like an Atlas shrugged um, when Dagny is leaving the Gulch one of the characters, I forget who it was, gives gives her advice that says, um, you know, if if you have a conflict between your heart and your mind, go with your mind. Like, it it's... So if, if you're unable to resolve the conflict, sure, go with your mind. But that doesn't mean, like, the heart doesn't matter, you know? It doesn't mean just ignore the heart. Like, try try to resolve the conflict. The best thing to do is to resolve the conflict. But if, if, you're, if you're stuck on it, then... And you have to go one way or the other and actually make a decision right now. Then go with your mind is like reasonable advice, uh, especially for Dagny's situation. I don't think it's I don't think it's always the best advice, but uh, you know, for what Dagny was doing, I think it was fine. Some choice over here, but we're really driven by this. Conscious. As conscious is there for me to explore, and I become a better person as I know what's better. I understand where my emotions are coming from, and I understand that better. But at the end of the day, when I make a choice out there, it's based on reality and facts. And see, see, you see, and I see reality and facts. I don't see anything coming between me and this, and this plastic bottle. Again, it's a nice plastic view, right? Here's a plastic bottle. I can see it. It's a plastic bottle. And, and uh, it's not something else. Yeah, I, I think Brooke is simplistic and just wrong. I think a lot of people say, what is plastic? What is water? What is that? 
But that's what it is. That's why it actually, if I have a second knowledge, get down into the molecular structure. And it's real. It's actually here. It's not created by the consciousness or interpreted by the consciousness. It really is what it is. So I... it is interpreted by his consciousness. Like it's the structure of of um protons and neutrons and electrons, and there's photons bouncing off it that are hitting his eye. And his consciousness is creating this like 3D image in his in his head. That there, there's lots of interpretation there. He's just being silly and like Peterson knows some popper and is, is probably going to win this argument and actually say something back. I think evolution is those tools. Let me ask you a question. Why is, a, why is a stump and a beanbag both a chair? Well, because you're talking about a stump and a beanbag both a chair. Because if you have a proper definition of a chair, then a stump and a beanbag both fit. But it's something to sit on. Yeah. So it's something to sit on. Yeah. Right? That is an inherent object. Sure. No, truth is. See, oh, my, my definition, definition, definition is not inherent to the object. Right, so sittableness is a human interpretation that we put on stumps and beanbags large beanbags like peterson's right and that that is a he's getting into sort of popperian territory the problem with the idea that the object presents itself is that two things are the same and different in the near infinite number of ways and that's also a technical problem so i can give you an example Right, so that's that's actually a very major important popper point, and Peterson's just completely right, and Aaron's making a fool of himself. So imagine that you're going to classify a set of six books. You're going to figure out how to arrange them on your shelf. That's easy. You can do that conceptual problem. By the way. It's actually not an easy thing to do because there's an indefinite number of ways that you can classify a finite number of objects. So you can classify the books by color, by age, by thickness, by weight, by number of e's, by number of a's, by number of e's on the first page, by number of words, by number of phrases. This is the question: Why am I classifying them? So that is the question. There's no intrinsic value to classifying books. The question is: Why do I want to classify them? And the answer to why I want to classify them will then determine how I classify them. Absolutely. But that's exactly that's the rub. The rub is you see that's the rub. Your classification system is dependent on why you apply it, and that's exactly the argument I've been using with Harris, which means the set of facts that reveal themselves to you in the world are dependent on your values. The sound's argument is that the values are derived from. Yeah, Peterson's just winning. He knows some popper, and Yaron's clueless. In fact, it's like, no, wait a minute. There's an infinite number of facts, and they present themselves in accordance with your values, with your, with your purpose. And so that, that demolishes the values from facts argument. Now, it makes it complicated. There's an interrelationship between like a causal interrelationship. But it is the case that your purpose determines the facts that raise themselves before you. And that's actually not disputable. No, 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 it's a fact. It's all. The actual fact is, <laughs> the actual fact is, they have six books. And the actual fact is that there's a infinite, if you will, way in which order them, and if you follow them, either, so, be in so the facts are all there. What my values introduce is how I'm going to order them. What are they? They're No, they might be firewood. They might be firewood. They might be a weapon. Yeah. There's lots of things they can be other than books. It's so so amusing to me because the first. Uh, <laughs> no, seriously, no. Because the first. Uh, I study and I've written quite a lot of conservation and classification in it. Uh, but whenever I'm writing, I've never said this before. Um, I remember back when I was a little kid, I had this bookshelf. And I was ordering books on the bookshelf, and I was thinking, what's the right way to do it? Uh, and of course, the answer is that there isn't one right way built into nature. Here's how everyone does it. It's a duty decimal system. If not for duty, no one would figure it out. Right? There are um, a, lot of, a lot of different ways you can order books, but there are also and anything else. Right? But there are also there's facts about the things that um, make it necessary to order them in certain ways uh, to achieve different purposes. Right? Uh, and to understand the that last part. And then there's very broad types of purposes we have to have in order to be able to think and function at all. Yes. Um, and those purposes are of getting to know as much reality as we can, of holding that reality in a way that won't flummox us and never do anything the word um, random time to this, a way that allows you to hold a lot of information in the context of review. Um, and there are certain facts we need to know and facts we don't because we're not here to navigate ourselves through the world, provide standards for how we uh, conceptualize yeah. So, although our purposes and our needs as human beings matter, it's not as though any purpose is just as good as any other. And there's a, we can come up with standards for objectivity of what, um, what is an objective way to form concepts and classify. In the same way, you can come up with standards for objectivity. I agree with everything you said, except I don't think you can come up with objectivity. I even think there's a hierarchy of values. Take this into objective that involves objective grades or objective reporting. Right? It's not that the grades are out there in the paper and you just gotta find it in there, or the newspaper story is already written and the reporter will find it. It's rather there's a way, maybe not just one, but a small range of them. A way that this has to be done in order to accomplish the purpose of doing it. Yes, there's a finite range of organizing things that will enable you to use them in a way that will mean that the concept being formed objectively or values being formed objectively. Okay, but, okay. But, but. There's a lot in that that I think is, is, is dead on. Like, I, I do believe, for example, that one of the ways we deal with the fact that there's a plethora of facts is that we impose interpretive structures on those facts. They're common to all of us because we have common goals. Like, we don't want to suffer and die, generally speaking. We want to stay alive. And our biological systems predispose us to act in ways that are commensurate with that. And, and so I don't think there's an infinite number of solutions to the fact that there's an infinite number of problems. That's where I think the postmodernists have gone wrong. But I think that when you say that what you've produced by, by constraining the solution set is somehow akin to objectivity, that, that's where I have a conceptual problem. Even though I don't disagree with the reason that you would make that case, then I guess what would happen is we have to define what constitutes objective. Because when I think of objective, I think about the strict application of the scientific method. And what that's done for us is lay out the world not values, but objective facts. If you're objective, you can lay out the objective facts, but I can't see how you can derive the damn values. Even though I do believe that there's a hierarchy of values and there's a finite hierarchy, I don't think putting that into the category of objective truth is reasonable because I don't think that those truths are objective. There's some, there's, there's some other form of truth. Well, and I think that that's generally captured in something like metaphor and narrative. Which I think Dave's not just move on in it. Well, I actually wasn't. I was thinking that maybe we dump the QA and just keep going because I... Wow, of course I actually got to that. I just wanted to say, I mean, so first I totally agree. One of these well, issues, we'll do that in a minute. One of these issues is how to define objectivity. I mean, this is another one of these satisfying questions, right? Uh, and that's an interesting question. Where does this concept come from? There's a whole history of different books, which is about the history of the concept of objectivity. That's something maybe for another occasion. Let's land that as a really interesting question. As for, just want to say something about these thoughts for me, and also something about whether we can get to the same conclusion starting from different places. Um, I see what Harris is doing is he's in the tradition of a lot of empiricists. It goes back to empiricists, definitely present in Mill and a different kind of way in Hume. Um, well, very different in Hume. Um, the history of empiricists, you think everything comes from perception. And you usually have a kind of fairly atomized view of perception because collections of sensation. And what these types of empiricists generally do when they get to ethics is they pick some sensation to identify their value terms with. So either pain, the sensation of pain is, or the sensation of suffering is the bad, and they're opposite that pleasure is good. So, this is boring. But anyways, what I wanted to say is the ways the objectivists are losing to Popper here are not things that Rand claimed. That, like, Peterson would not be able to come on the FI forum and then just, like, 
have a bunch of Rand quotes and show why they're wrong using the arguments he's using. It's like, where did Rand ever say that? So I, I think the objectivists are getting themselves into trouble with ideas that are not in Rand's books. And they're not they're not saying that. They're not saying um the the thing you're arguing with is my position, but it wasn't Rand, so like an objectivist doesn't have to believe this. Like they're not differentiating it from objectivism proper. Which is important. If you're going to go on stage as a representative of, of objectivism, you should know which things you're saying are Ayn Rand's views, like objectivism proper, and which things are not. Which things are, uh, you know, common to the objectivist community in general, and which things are just your ideas personally. And those are, those are three different things, like Ayn Rand's objectivism, um, believed by many objectivists today, like led by Peikoff or Binswanger or ARI or whatever, and uh, just your personal views. I don't think that's really the deriving value from facts. All that's doing is identifying value with certain very, very simple facts. So what I think the real question about deriving value from facts is, is we have these value concepts, concepts like good and bad, that we use to direct ourselves, direct ourselves through life. How do we form these concepts? And have these concepts be formed based on facts in an objective manner, as opposed to just being found out there already, or um, or just being able to make a door to make a mind, there's no way to tell if the Nazis or the Klux Klan or the Communists or we are right about the values. Um, it's like, the whole structure of this is wrong. They, like, like, what's the point of this? They're just, it's just intellectual chit-chat. Like, they're not showing us why philosophy matters and how to use philosophy to improve your life and, and how to use philosophy to even organize the discussion so you can see the point of it. So I think you have to take this question back to the broader question of how you form concepts and what kind of ways does perceptual evidence play in forming And in the case of value concepts, here I'm, I'm throwing a random you should um, what I think we do is, at the deepest level, it comes from the needs of living organisms. There are certain ways they need to function in order to survive and prosper. And values are the way that we conceptualize that. They conceptualize that for a human value in a conceptual form is identification of something the human being needs to live. And he values it as far as he chooses to live, and in some form recognizes that it will contribute to his life. But what I think ethics are... The overall impression you get is that, like, Jordan is being, like, a bit gentler than he could. Like, he's going a little easy on them. Like, he's, he's not trying to be, like, mean or embarrass them or anything. But, like, he's, you know, he's firmly in control, and he's ex exerting himself or, like, asserting himself as, as much as he needs to um, when he thinks it's important or disagrees with something or whatever. But, like, he's not going out of his way to, like, push these guys around, but he's pushing them around, like, just a little bit anyways. And these guys, when they talk, like, they're not challenging Peterson at all. A branch of philosophy, the science of that has to do, is really articulate the foundations of these values, where they come from, what the fundamental values are, what the fundamental ways of achieving them are. So, how would that your perspective from the that was that was just so like tangential and boring and what was the point of it and so in some sense prior to that human beings were identifying things as values in conceptual terms we learned it uh, as we're kids we learned something good something bad and what a philosophical theory of values is meant to do is to articulate why that works what it is that we're doing there when we do that but other people who don't have the same theory as us will have some of the same values and so we might come to the same conclusions but without being able to fully defend or articulate them the same way that both of us said the Nazis were bad and the Nazis were bad uh, even though we started in some sense but I think to fully develop and understand what's bad about them uh, and to find out consistently on the more difficult cases uh, of what's been bad uh, although the Nazis were a difficult case for a lot of people and communists that's where we need to get that from well because you know if you're making a claim which I think is it's, it's a justifiable claim whether or not it's after, um, is that our ethics are grounded in something like the necessity, the necessity for survival and reproduction, which are variants of survival, obviously. It's a Darwinian claim. It's a claim that the American pragmatists advanced as well, because this is, this is um, Person and William uh, James and primarily. Yeah. You know, they believe that your, your knowledge was a tool, knowledge was a tool to advance being in the world, let's say survival in the world, and that you justified your knowledge not because you had finite, final knowledge of anything, but because your tools were good enough to obtain the end that you were aiming at. That was the validation process. If your theory was good enough to get you to where you were aiming, then it was true enough, and the pragmatists believe that that was the best that you could do with truth. And then when Darwin advanced his theory, the American pragmatists said, oh, look, Darwin's theory is actually an extension of pragmatism. Pragmatism is the notion that your truths are good enough to facilitate your survival. But this is the problem. So that's Darwin. There's a, there's a truth that's embedded in Darwinian worldview. That is not the same truth that's embedded in the Newtonian worldview. There's a conflict between those two. And the Newtonian worldview is basically the world of facts, right? Roughly speaking. And there's a, there's a set of claims about truth that are based in the Newtonian worldview. And they're not the same as the ones that are based in the Darwinian worldview. It's a big problem. And part of the reason that I've been arguing with Sam for like three years is because he's. I, I think this is nonsense. Like, Darwinian evolution says there are facts about what happens when replicators are exposed to selection pressures. Like, it's super factual. There's no values there. It, it helps explain, like, values and design and stuff, but, like, the, the basics of, like, biological evolution is just, they're like laws of physics, like, or laws of logic or something. You know, there's just, like, no getting away from, you know, replication with variation and selection causes adaptation. That, that's not, like, values or anything. It's like Newton. 
an evolutionary psychologist in principle and a biological thinker, and yet he essentially has a Newtonian worldview that is the world of facts that's real. So, no, no, there's a world of values, and the world of values is devoted not towards determining what's objectively true, but towards facilitating survival. And those are not the same thing. Now, there's See, facilitating survival, no, facilitating replication. And, like, adaptation towards replication has nothing to do with values. Like, it can happen without values. Animals don't even have values. Like, Peterson thinks animals have values. He's so confused. Um, like, in the same way that humans have values. Like, he doesn't understand that, that human values are a different thing that require... Um, intelligence which animals don't have and it's not just a matter of degrees and if, if you want more on this watch my my videos commenting on his book it's the relationship between them because the world of values and the world of facts coexists but the relationship doesn't seem to be one-to-one -one. i mean the world of values is a value that is a world of facts they are fact of it that's what you're doing it really is a world of it really all facts of it values exist here exist in the mind of individuals we value something it's there are no values out there independent of value work so these are two different dimensions and so anyway, any, any work on, you know they, part of value is identifying the facts yes this is the rub two different dimensions like that's that's such a bad way to put it. It sounds dualist or like fact value dichotomy. And like where on earth did Rand say something like that? I really would expect Rand to be anti dualist and to say that like values of are, are part of reality and not to like put them in some other dimension. <laughs> what? The American pragmatists are interesting philosophy. Why not talk about objectivism? Why don't you doesn't Rand have something to add to this? Why aren't you bringing up Rand? That would be so much better. Peterson is so confident. He's like, let me give you an example. You'll all understand this very rapidly. And he's social signaling that like he's a good explainer and teacher and so on, and that he's more powerful than the other people and, and that everyone should listen to him. And I mean, with some justice, like not total justice, but some justice. He, he does stand out more than the other people on the stage. Which is sad because Ayn Rand would have smoked him. Ayn Rand would stand out so much more than Peterson. If, if Ayn Rand were on the stage, she'd be leading the discussion. She'd be asking him hard questions he couldn't answer. And when, when he just started talking like fluffy, confusing things, um, what the objectivists on the stage do is they just, they just talk fluffy, confusing things right back. Like they're, they're like, yeah, that, that's hard, and here's some of my thoughts about it, and they just go off and talk. And, and Ayn Rand would actually like bring it back to clear questions and actually get like decisive answers, resolve things, like like bring it to a head instead of just let's, oh, these are hard issues, let's talk a bit. You know, they're treating it like uh, what objectivists call an intellectual bull session, like college, college kids just like debate or stay up like, you know, saying things and they don't really know what they're talking about. It's like a a scenario that objectivists have referred to a few times, and that's kind of how this this discussion is going. But if Ayn Rand were on stage, that would not be what's happening. She would she would ground it in reality, have clear, hard questions, have answers, and be unsatisfied with like wishy washy half answers. Imagine you're married to someone and you trust them and they betray you and you discover that one day. So that's the world objecting to your stupid theory. That's for sure. Because you had a theory about who you were and a theory about who your partner was and a theory about what your life was and that theory was seriously wrong. Past, present, and future are all something radically new. You might say, well, a new set of facts confronts you. Really? Is that right? Okay. Just what are those facts? It's like you'll be in a pit for two or three years trying to just get the bare facts out of that situation. The only thing you'll know for sure in the world against your stupid theory is that you were wrong. It's not like the world is going to raise it. It's like, who is this person that I was married to? That's what's going to be questioned. And the question is, what kind of fool was I for making these presuppositions to begin with? And it's not like that new knowledge will manifest itself in a set of. Yeah, he's, he's right here, and this is Popper. Like, when experiment or reality contradicts your theory 
it doesn't you don't know what the truth is you just know you are wrong that that's completely correct you you do get some some data points but you you still have to figure out what's going on instantly apprehensible facts about the true nature of the world. You're going to be suffering like that for a very good long time before you can take what you have, which is in fact but just confusion, and transform that into something that's even vaguely resembling a set of apprehensible facts. You'll be in serious psychological trouble until the world re-reveals itself as a set of apprehensible facts. And if you're traumatized badly enough, it'll never happen. And so that's another part of the problem with the idea that the world just represents itself as facts from which you can derive values. It's like not when you're bloody confused. And you're confused a lot. And you're confused when the range of potential that's manifested exceeds your, your, your grasp, exceeds your capabilities. And then the way you respond to that isn't even cognitively. The way you respond to that is part of the body cognition. What do you do when something incomprehensible objects to you? Well, it depends on how incomprehensible it is. But let's say, what did you do when the Twin Towers fell? Was it a set of facts? Something? You didn't know what the hell was going on. You didn't know anything else. What you did was go into a state of crisis. And that state of crisis is actually an embodied pre-cognitive response. And what happens biologically is that you get flooded with cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And what it does is prepare you to take a very large array of potential actions. That's your response. He's just giving, like, his own lectures, and the objectivists are just sitting there. And then when he finishes, they're not going to be like, I disagree with that cortisol stuff. Rand was making fun of that in the Fountainhead. With the, the Gal and Gallstone parody. So it's not like the world has arrayed itself as a set of facts from which you can derive value. What happens is the world has arrayed itself as an incomprehensible mystery, and you have to do something about that. And what you do is ratchet up your physiology so that you're burning yourself up. Because you age faster than this sort of thing happens, which is why you age faster if you're in crisis. You burn yourself up in the attempt to do everything at once, prepare to do everything at once. And that's really the world manifesting itself as an object and objecting to your theory. It doesn't count as an array of facts, but it's so lovely. Every time you were wrong, what happened was a new array of facts. But the point is that the reality doesn't just show up, it's not just an array of facts. But when that cortisol happens, when that event happens, what you do is consciously make an effort to find the facts. If, if yes, you, yes, if you, for sure. So the facts are still in reality. So something happened in 9 /11. So the first thing you do is what actually happened. You have to figure out what actually happened. It's real work, real cognitive effort. Who are these people? Where, where does the ideology drive them? Why did they do it? All of these things. All facts that exist in reality, your responsibility, your responsibility, I think, to yourself, is to go find and discover the facts that are relevant for the decisions and actions you need to take given the event that's happened. So yes, psychologically, it's going to be a wise change. You'll get confused. But I think your job as a human being is okay. What actually happened? And where did I make my mistakes? So Yaren's not really addressing the issue. He says, like, go figure out the relevant facts. But that's which facts are relevant is a matter of interpretation. So you have to interpret. So Peterson's right on the core issue that it's not just facts. Like, you have to. You have to have uh, values or interpretations or something. Like, you have to have some theories first. It's hot. This is what this is what free will is. Free will is. And if your theories or values or interpretations, whatever, are wrong, then uh, your your investigation of the facts will come out wrong. Engaging reason, engaging our consciousness to discover the facts out there and, and apply them to making a new conclusion, right? Okay, so, so something's wrong in my values my life. What was it? Did you really betray me? Are the facts true? Is, is what's going on here real? So all of it is, again, a return to reason, a return to, right. so a return to discovery of facts, which is what, what reason does. Okay, so two things. First, you mentioned relevant, the relevant facts, and that's the problem. But I would also say, interestingly enough, in relationship to your argument, the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget made a very similar claim. He said that because the domain of established facts was mutable, and that's the, that's the issue, say, with the fact that you're... It's interesting that Peterson picked up on it. Like, Peterson caught relevant. Like, this is one of the first times someone's actually, like, quoted the other person. And, and Peterson's like, you weren't just looking at raw facts, you were looking at relevant facts. So you, you are acknowledging Popper, you're conceding the thing I'm talking about. He, di he didn't actually go into that and explain it, but he, he picked up on that and, and mentioned that was like the key word there. Like he caught Brooke, like Peterson actually knows what he's talking about on this subject and heard what Brooke was saying and, and knows what's going on and was, was able to like in real time identify the key word there. I did it in 2.5x, so that's like faster than real time. So I'm, I'm extra clever. I mean, I don't know, maybe Peterson could have done that too. But uh, it, it's good. Whereas when Peterson talks, like the objectivists never are like, you, you said like this key word and, and you know, they never picked up on like the right things to comment on. Parker could betray you, even what you know can be, can be mutable, right? Then what is relevant in the search for truth isn't the search for a set of mutable facts, but the search for the process by which, by which facts are generated from the chaotic potential to begin with. It's not exactly how Piaget worded it, but, but, but the facts are there. You might see the train you should not train. It's not, it's not, it's always a potential, it's not a potentiality. See, but now he's going back on it. First, he said you have to figure out like the relevant. Like he doesn't get that relevance is an interpretation, and that you can change your mind about what's relevant, and it's not just like raw facts. So he's he's gonna lose more now because he doesn't get popper. Like if if the only issue was did she betray me or not, like then there wouldn't be very much room for interpretation of um, what the right issue is because. You know, he's just assuming there's just this one clear-cut issue. But, like, in real life, the issue is not just did she betray me or not. It's what are the details of the betrayal? How bad is it? Is it recoverable? Um, was, it, was it an accident? Could I get her back? Should I get her back? Do I want her back? How did this happen? Why did this happen? What did I do wrong? Like, there's so many so many relevant facts. And, like, when you, when you start investigating, like, how did this happen? Um... You know, there are a bunch of facts about times you left the toilet seat up, and you might think those are relevant or not relevant, and that depends on your philosophical theories. It's not just a matter of facts about whether that's relevant or not. I mean, there are facts that have to do with it, like um, there are facts about whether she noticed you left the toilet seat up or not, whether she cared or not. But but there's also like 
you know, a great deal of theory and interpretation about whether that was actually important. Like she might, she might say, oh, I, I noticed you left the toilet seat up a lot and it bothered me a lot. And that was one of the things that drove us apart. But even if she says that, it's still completely reasonable to, to doubt it, to interpret that she's lying or confused or fooling herself or rationalizing or making excuses. It's still completely possible to say, you know, even though those are facts and, and she's claiming that's what happened, I doubt it. Like, I think the real thing that happened was something totally different. Like, like uh, you know, she read a bunch of uh, romance novels and she was bothered by how her life did not match the stories. And she watched The Bachelorette and she was bothered by how her life and our dates did not match what she sees on TV. And, and very gradually over time, uh, she felt like, more emotionally flat towards me because I wasn't providing like her ideal fantasies from books and TV. And, and maybe that's why we drifted apart is because she got this like unrealistic notion into her head. And now she's going to leave me and go on first dates where people fake those things better and approximate them. And it never lasts, but you know, it, temporarily people make it look more like, like romance with sparks and, and it fits more of the fantasy. You know, that, that would be an interpretation. The, it wasn't the toilet thing, it was that. And th there will be some facts relevant to that interpretation. And there's plenty of other interpretations possible. And you, you have to go look at, like, so many facts. And most of them aren't so important, and some are. And it's hard to figure out. And Yaron Brook just doesn't know all this stuff. And, and Popper and Peterson do. But it is. Uh, it's not dependent on you discovering it or not. Your responsibility to marriage is, is to know whether your is between you or not. Uh, hopefully, hopefully you don't need to do that exercise because uh, she's not in, 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 in your trust in that. And, but your consciousness is identifying the truth of yourself. It's not some array of infinite possibilities. You could be trained. You could be trained. You could be trained. You could be trained. So the two possibilities. He says it's not an array of infinite possibilities, but it is. Like, there are infinitely many different reasons she might have betrayed you for, just as a matter of logic. And you have to narrow it down. Like, what are, what are the plausible ones? What are the ones worth investigating? And you're narrowing down the infinite set to what you're going to investigate. And that, that is something you can screw up. And, and you might have to be like, you know, I think I investigated the wrong things. I'm going to go look at the bigger picture again and, and find some other possibilities to investigate. Because I, I don't think I've understood what went on well enough. Because it wasn't just she betrayed me or not. There's more to understand. And I haven't gotten there yet. So I'm going to look more. She's a betrayer, she's not. And your job is to apply reason, which I take as identifying what is true and what is not, what is factual and what is not, what is the evidence, weighing the evidence. And then there's a whole lot of psychological stuff why it happens to be what it actually nice Weighing the evidence. So, uh, you know, see my yes or no philosophy. It's a uh, yes or no philosophy dot com. And, and I explain why weighing the evidence is wrong. More, more uh, popper oriented stuff. Like that's within the, the popper framework, basically. That's something that Rand didn't know. It, it's partly my improvement, but it, it fits popper better because popper made some mistakes of, of the same sort. Because Popper said stuff about like weighty arguments. See, he's trying to just make it this simple issue, and that's that's not how life is, and that's not how marital betrayals are. It's not just did she or didn't she, like did she sleep with someone else or not? Like, you know, sometimes there's a reasonably clear cut issue, but there's always like details of it, like that you want to know what happened more, and, and how to understand it. Like, um, you know, was she raped? It's not just did she have sex with that man, but, you know, if he raped her, then you're going to forgive her. You know, whereas if she did it on purpose, that's different. And th there's there's grayer areas. Like, what what if he gave her drugs? But not, not drugs that made her unconscious, but drugs that, like, screwed with her judgment. And, like, you know, she thought she was, like, a little bit drunk, but actually she was, like, you know, barely conscious because of these drugs. And... You know, there are different levels of how much the drugs knocked her out and screwed with her ability to make her own choices. And, and so all of those things could affect, you know, it's not just did she or didn't she sleep with him, you know. And, and you don't just want to know, did she betray me? What are the facts? You want to know, like, why, what happened? What was the story behind this? What was the narrative? What was the explanation? Is she just a careless, sloppy person who doesn't care very much about marriages? How did I not notice that? Or, or was there some like ongoing pattern of problems that led to this and built up to it? And what were they? And, you know, I, I better find out what those were because what if, you know, am I going to have another relationship? Maybe the same thing will happen. How do I prevent it from happening again? 
And and if you decide that a lot of the fault was your own, that you were a major part of the buildup of problems that led to this, you might you might forgive your wife and and try to fix things if if she's apologetic and realizes that she has fault too. You know, it, you know sometimes they cheat on you and they're hostile and they're like, you know, I want to leave you. I'm done with you. I'm mad at you. I like this guy more. But sometimes they cheat and they're like, you know, I fucked up and and we both contributed to things going badly, but I'd like to try to repair them. And you might agree with that and potentially try to repair it. It's not relatively simple. No, that was, that was, Jordan Peterson picked this example because most people realize it's not relatively simple. So you're, you're looking dumb, Yaron. Aw, I wanted, I wanted Jordan to reply there, but Craig's butting in. Because I thought Jordan was going to crush that. It's interesting he says that's not the definition of the world, because in Fabric of Reality, um, David Deutsch says, like, the criteria of reality is that it kicks back, that it can object to your theories. And it's, it's very similar, like, that. that's actually how you know something is real, is that it can object to things, that it can... that can have an effect that like it can be part of tests i didn't i didn't fully explain that like that that might be confusing but i'm going to move on when you get into this situation and this is why the practice takes you off so the theory's just there we're not too interested in how we got there except by repeated episodes of what happened which is that the world of it, and then you go scrambling to try to get out of this game positive dissonance that you're really interested in but you know um doing that when you disease right everything's easy and nice you don't have to think you just go by in some super but, uh, and then some fact of jackson now you've got a world of jackson now you've been dissonant and you've got to figure out how to reconfigure your mental life so that you can get on with it. and that is what a lot of people do that's not right a lot of people something unexpected and horrible happened and what they were motivated to do was figure out what are the fewest moves i can make to get to go back to normal and be all right i don't care what's true i don't care what really did i don't care what would really solve it i just care what i can tell myself to make this confusion and disruption and agitation go away and that's dishonesty and that's wrong and to really value honesty and to get the right answer and being rational in these and caring about what happens to your damn life you can't say you know oh i just want to be back into blissful oblivion by coming up with some new Greg isn't talking about like the disagreement about philosophy. Like Peterson has actually been like more philosophical than the other people to some extent, and like he's been bringing up Popperian philosophy that he knows pretty well and knows some things about, and the other people are just sort of out of their depth, and they're not giving a good showing for objectivism. Yeah. Uh, now I see the theory wrong. What mistake did I make along the way? What was the process by which I generated this theory? And what was the misstep in that process? How can I fix it to generate a new theory? One that will be true. And that, that process by which you generate your theory, the process of forming concepts, the process of collecting evidence, it's a complicated process. It's a lot to say. Right? Sounds like repentance and atonement to me. <laughs> uh, it can be, but it's in that you're acknowledging an error and you're trying to fix it, but you're trying to see how you made this theory and how you can make it better. And if you, this idea that... Greg is so appeasing. Like, Peterson just throws in a religious reference, and Greg's like, it can be. Not, I disagree with the religious connotations of what you're saying. Like, those are, you could loosely, metaphorically try to connect religion to this and, and say a religion isn't all wrong, and that's fine, but, like, you know, religion doesn't make thinking about this better, it makes it worse. That That's what Greg should have replied if he's going to be anti-religion. I, like, I don't think sin and atonement or repentance and atonement or whatever are the right way to think about intellectual progress processes. I don't think that's helpful. I don't think you should... Uh, view it that way like i don't think you should find criticism like threatening and i don't think you have to atone for your mistakes like like making mistakes and correcting them is just part of a good life and it doesn't require atonement and it doesn't have to be viewed negatively like that so i think and and you certainly don't have to bring like god or religion into it and like start uh start connecting it to mysticism somehow so so i would disagree with jordan making that connection and, and Greg just doesn't, and he's just like, oh, sure, bring in the religious words. You're sort of right. And then he just moves on, and he doesn't challenge it. And Jordan's just walking all over him, and he's so passive and appeasing. And this idea that philosophy and real thinking start to become contradiction. You get this back in the Greeks with the dialectical tradition, debating each other. And I think there's something really profound in Aristotle, uh, as opposed to Plato and the other Greeks. The other Greeks, they seem to annihilate Hegel. They come up with contradictions. They say, what can we do to get past this contradiction? But what Aristotle always does, and all his books have this structure, it's really, he, he gets into a field by discussing debates in it. He shows all the contradictions, all the puzzles, and he can't be this and this. And then he says, let's start fresh. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's think about how we got here. And then he crafts a new theory, starting from the kind of facts that motivated the old theory, or the observations that say motivated the old theory, but that avoids the difficulties anymore. Rather than just trying to reconfigure it, go forward, you go back. And if there's a hierarchy, not just a hierarchy of values, but also a hierarchy of understanding of the world, certain ways of understanding the more basic and others are built up on top of that, when you find that one of your theories, the theory is really complex. When you find that one of your theories is the same, you think, how can I go back to the more basic, more primitive types of knowledge, uh, more basic types of observations, whatever it might be, from which I generated this theory, and then and now add to it new observations and new knowledge that I have based on what went wrong, and generate a new theory that will be better than it. Yeah, I'm looking for a last word. Right? Well, yes, but, <laughs> well, but the problem is, you know, it, that works. <clears throat> There's two problems with it. One is that it's really, 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 really difficult, cognitively, because the more of your theory you have to unpack, like imagine that your theory is composed of, of presumptions, and the more basic the presumption, the more your world is organized as a consequence of that presumption. And so, like the presumption of your partner's fidelity is a very fundamental presumption because the entire interpretation of your relationship is predicated on that assumption. And so, if you let that assumption go, then you let everything you know about your relationship go, and that casts you into chaos more and more thoroughly. So, the more you go back, Jordan's coming back to his example because it's good for him in ways the objectivist just totally didn't pick up on or address. 
and, he, and he's right about this. Like relationships are complicated. He's he's just gonna win. The first principle to advise your theory: the more cognitive I don't like this, the, the more you throw your state, yourself into a state of existential crisis, and the more you end up psychophysiologically preparing for catastrophe as a consequence, and the faster you die. So the problem with unglueing things back down to the first principle is actually what happens to people by waiting. Like he's not right about everything he's saying. Like the faster you die, like this this biology stuff. I mean, it's not like totally wrong, but he's he's overemphasizing it, and it's it's a bit confused. And. I mean, for more on that, like, see my videos on his book where I talk about serotonin and stuff, and that'll give you some flavor of what's going on there and uh, address some similar issues. The post-traumatic stress disorder is that you undo yourself in doing that, and when you undo yourself, there's a physiological price to pay. So even though that is the root out, make a fundamental error, you should make fundamental reparations. The cost of doing that is unbelievably high. And so people are loath to do it, even though they might have to do it, because of course, you know, you were saying it was wrong to paper over an error, and I asked, well, why is it wrong? It makes you feel better, why is it wrong? Which is a perfectly good question. But the answer to why it's wrong is, well, why would you want to make the same stupid error again? Why if the error was, cause I failed? You make it two more times, you're dead. And so the cost of repeating, that's the thing about cognitive errors. Insofar as they're enacted, if there are errors and you make them in the world of the world of the accident, it takes you apart. And if there is problem enough, then you suffer a lot and die. Maybe not just you, but the errors may be really profound. So it might be that you have to... No one here knows that you, like, you make thousands of errors every day. Like, errors just ever-present. They're just sort of only looking at serious errors, or, like, big errors. Um, so I think that's, like, a big oversight. That, like, you know, little errors are just this ever-present part of our thought that we're dealing with all the time, and it's not so scary. And, and we need to think about that, and how, how do we find and correct errors? Not just the big, scary, dangerous ones, but like just any errors, and that's that's how we that's how we think well. Like they don't have the right concept of error. They're just sort of like if you aren't if you aren't making one of these giant errors, then you're not wrong, then you're right. That's kind of how people view things, and it's really naive. And, and they're all making this mistake. Because otherwise you'll fall through. But nonetheless, the cost of doing that is so high that you're going to shy away from it. And people do that all the time. Partly why they take the easy routes. Like they take the easy routes is difficult route. It's difficult. It's really difficult. But I think about what you have to figure out if you were subject to a betrayal like that. It's like, well, maybe you married the wrong person. That's possible. Maybe you created the wrong person in your marriage, in your interaction, in interactions with your partner. Or maybe you're so damn naive that it's just absolutely beyond comprehension. Like, there's all sorts of terrible things lurking under the revelation of that objection. And taking down your to, to, to pull them out is it's a hell of a job. Like, that's the confrontation with <clears throat> the terrible dragon of chaos. And in that confrontation, you need to be burnt to a crisp. You know? So this is why like, it's so it's so crucial to know yourself and to build a solid foundation of self uh, in any relationship, right? So that so that it's not somebody else's betrayal does not unwind everything. You just know yourself. Like that's so naive. Like Peterson saying it's hard, and the audience is is getting it and being like, yeah, that's hard. Like. If your wife cheats on you, that would like throw your thinking into chaos and you'd wonder if you were naive or what happened. And there's so many possibilities and it'd be confusing and it'd be hard to unpack. And you know, that all makes sense and he's right. And then Yaron's just like, oh, we'll just try to know yourself. And everyone's thinking like, I do try to know myself. It's still hard. And are you just saying it's easy? And if, if I learn objectivism, I'll just know myself or something? Because if, you, if you're claiming that, that's ridiculous. And like people are right to scoff at that. That's not what objectivism offers. That's not the right way to present objectivism. Because objectivism can help a lot with these things, but it's, it's not not quite like that. Think about yourself. So uh, you, you can't go that any time reality doesn't act your theory, you completely unlike, right? right? So, so knowing oneself, having a solid foundation, a sense of uh, you know, self-esteem, sense of self-worth, sense of self-esteem, sense of confidence, and, and having a philosophical foundation, this is why, as you said, it's hard work. And now we can conclude that is morality is hard work. Living is hard work. Uh, you went back to, to the idea of, of the habits of survival. One of the things that, that, we, you know, that I hold, you know, we hold, I think, is that survival quality is a human being, which I mean, it's a human being, it's a lot of work. And it requires particular type of work, particularly reasoning and thinking and figuring stuff out. And the more work we do, the more we build our character, the easier it is to deal with these shocks to the system, the easier it is to deal with the 9-11 of what we trade off. You know what we are. And now we just need to figure out the facts out. We can deal with the facts out. reality throws at you. If you've done the moral work to create a moral character, you should be able to deal with it. Okay, you're best shot at. <laughs> well, I got seriously stiff neck for looking that way. Well, that, I'm sorry, guys. Thank you over there. Um, yeah. um, well, I, this was such a perfect example of why I love the reality that I like the thing I created. Maybe somebody came from before. He's going to get this is it. I mean, what do you think what? about Well, we just stayed here for an hour what was on CNN for the last hour. I mean, you know, this really is it. And, you know, these, are, these are huge differences, and in some ways, they're. What a, what a just like. Ri there's, it's just substanceless praise. And everyone's clapping. They're so second handed. The audience, like. Ruben's just telling them what to think. You're, you guys are so much smarter than CNN. And they're like, yeah, we're so much smarter than CNN. Clap, clap, clap. And there were so many things wrong with that discussion. And, like, objectivism did not come off looking that good. And, and where are the people saying, like, you're betraying objectivism? Where's the person standing up and saying, hey, objectivism is better than this? small difference, and that's what I want to end for our final five minutes here, is why is it that so seemingly these days so few people are willing to do this, so few people are willing to tour the country, to talk all to all sorts of people, have all sorts of different things, put their ideas on the line, and, and do all the philosophical work that you do, and around you also travel the world, and it seems there's an absolute starvation for it, and yet so few people are doing it, and I'll start doing the world. Yeah, and Ruben's just like, we're all smart, um, I mean, the, which, which is a theory that lends itself to people thinking Peterson is the smartest, like, we're all smart, and Peterson is the most popular for a reason, like, he wasn't challenged. He wasn't. It wasn't like we're all smart and the objectivists kind of 
you know, beat him or anything. It's like Peterson came into it as the favorite, got the most attention, and did absolutely fine and, and seemed to carry himself well. And and so seems to be the smartest. And it's just being left at that with no one contradicting it. And 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 Ruben's being generous and saying, Hey, you guys are pretty smart too, not bad. And and they're like they're they're happy with that. They're taking it. They're not like my goal was to crush and challenge Peterson to stand up to him, to say he's wrong about some important things. And they, they haven't done that at all. And they weren't trying to, and it's pathetic. And they're nothing like Ayn Rand. They're not firebrands. They're boring. They're poor representatives of objectivism. And and they're content with that, and that's why they bring Peterson in and they act that way. And they, They're not like, oh shit, I need to get better at this. I'm not going to bring in Peterson until actually I know how to stand up to him. Like They're, they're just happy with their performance. Like They're not going to be... They're not going to have a crisis after this and be like, ARI needs to change. We need better intellectuals. We need firebrands. We need people who are more charismatic than Peterson, more skilled, uh, better debaters, etc. They're just going to be like, this was fine. We did fine. We spread we spread objectivism. We got Peterson fans and Rubin fans to watch. And they're going to be like, hey, objectivism is pretty good. Like, that's what they're going to think. And it's so pathetic. And they're not going to get, like, good, good fans that way. But, I mean, ARI, ARI is already crap. So maybe it doesn't even deserve good fans. Well, I, mean, I think because those people who don't want to have a debate have no ideas. They're really empty. Um, then you listen. So... What debate? You guys didn't fucking debate. Not really. Like, it was mostly agreeing. It wasn't very challenging. Cases in the... Like, where were the hard questions asked between each other? There, there wasn't much conflict. And if you really wanted to have a debate and figure out the truth of the ideas, you'd write things. You'd take your time. It wouldn't be like an hour and a half. It would be... You know, Peterson would say something, and you'd, you'd have, you know, a few days to write your reply. And then he'd have a few days to write his reply, and so on. And even even quite short replies, you'd, you'd take your time and be thoughtful, and, and, you know, put your best foot forward, put your best words forward. Instead of making it this show, where charisma is such a big part of it. See what the objectivists are getting out of this is they're not very good, and they get to share a stage with Peterson, and he's respectful, and he treats them like they're decent intellectuals who are, you know, not quite as good as him, but maybe eighty percent of the way there. And that's, in some ways, that's, like, overly generous, and he's being nice to them and letting them, like, hang off his coattails. And I think that, that they're happy to get that out of it. And that, that's so pathetic. Same thing. It's my revelation. My revelation, you know, Islam, Christianity, whatever the religion is. It's my revelation. It's not The truth is revealed to me. You know, there's no logic, there's no reason, there's no rationality that can challenge the fact that God spoke to me, flew a book, whatever the way he spoke to me, and this is the truth, and there's nothing else that can be discussed. So you've got two sides. All they have is emotion and action. Reason, ideas, debate, discussion. As soon as you abandon reason, as soon as you abandon the idea of conversation, the logic is a way in which we debate, discuss, and discuss the truth. Then now you abandon speech. Right? So they're against free speech because they're against reason because they're against reality. There, there is, is a really the beauty of this. It's not that there has to be a knockout here. That's something else we can drag off stage. It's everyone, although wait for the closer. But that really, that everyone here, the, the 600 some odd people here, can take what they've heard here and then start finding their own logic and reason and figure out what they do. And one thing I always think in the same way, that connection is that your minds are rarely changed in the course of the argument. Doesn't mean you're not changed by an argument. But if you are having an argument now, it's that's something important indeed. It's very unlikely that one of us at the end of the 15 minutes of argument that's come away with a change in the world. That's occasionally, but often, you know, you go home, you think about it, I think both of us improve our thinking as a result of that, and maybe sometimes you can change it. That's so anti-Firebrand. He's just like, I didn't really expect to change anyone's mind. We just argue about it, and then maybe people think about things later and maybe change their mind a bit later over time. Like, where's the decisiveness? Where's the, like, I have a crushing argument, you're wrong, here's why, you should change your mind. Like, that's what Ayn Rand would have done. Ayn Rand isn't like, oh, we'll, we'll all share some thoughts, and then everyone will be like, that was good food for thought, we're all so smart, and then they'll go home, and over the next month, maybe they'll think about it, and maybe they'll change a little. Like, Ayn Rand wouldn't be, like, happy with that. Like, you know, realistically, maybe that's what's going to happen with a lot of the audience, because they're not great. But you don't you don't have to promote that as, like, the ideal. You you could, you know, struggle against it and, and try for more. None of these people will debate me, of course. So, and, like, no one will debate. Like, if you can find someone who wants to debate me, let me know. Get in touch, please. One important thing with products, and, and you know, this is a product that we're creating here, people consume, is there's a lot of times in the world when there's a potential demand for a product, and people who create that product, and nobody notices it. And it goes a long time ago, you know, but what's great about entrepreneurs is there's a people who notice there's an opportunity for this. They figure it out and they create something new. And I think that's what you're doing here, right? Uh, you probably wouldn't really go on tour a couple years ago, um, and you know, you're on, but, um, but before it was proven that there were these people who wanted to hear this and there were these different connections together, nobody would have known to do it. And so, what all of you guys are doing uh, in this connection, particularly bringing really, really, really these people together on the long form talk show, I think it's fantastic. And creating this kind of value, I see it as one of the things that, one of the hopeful signs in the culture that's the value of the signs that you're on top of on both political sides. 
You have to take us out soft, you're going to be the kill. This is yours. They're very friendly group of people. Well, look, I mean, if you're going to talk about... If you're going to... Peterson gets the first words at the beginning and the last words now, and Ruben's like, you can go for the kill or you can be friendly. It's like, it's just giving Peter Peterson like the, the alpha status, the top of the hierarchy, the top of the social dominance hierarchy, and it's so blatant. And and the audience is fine with it, and the objectives sitting right there are fine with it, and they're not objecting. If you're saying publicly about difficult things, if they can speak publicly about difficult things, then you're going to cause trouble. Because you can't talk about something difficult without causing trouble. If it was easy, then everyone would agree. And then you can talk about it, no one would care because everyone already knew that it would be easy. But if it's difficult and you talk about it, then you're going to upset people. And then when you upset people... Peterson's taking the high road partly because it's higher social status. Like, he's not threatened by them. He doesn't need to go for the kill because they're not scary to him. So he just looks great doing this. They're going to yell at you a lot. And then, well, that's what's going to happen. And then, you know, if you're not sure that there's any support for your position or... And they're satisfied because they didn't get killed. So they're like... I don't know. I, I think that's a success for them. They're not. They're not very good intellectuals. They're not that. They're not spectacular. Even if you're sort of vaguely human and it upsets you to be yelled at by many, many people, no, you can't shut up if a whole bunch of people are yelling at you because you might be wrong and also you might be in danger. But but what happens right now is that well, two things. One thing to know is that just because some people yell at you right now doesn't mean that all people will yell at you over the next month, right? So the people who are being thoughtful about it are going to be quieter and they might be sort of hiding in the woodwork. And so you have to learn that. But then the other thing is that we've talked about this quite a bit in this tour is that there's a technological revolution that's occurring that's enabling these long-form conversations and it wasn't possible before. Like we can live stream this, right, for no cost. And so a whole bunch of people can watch this. And the technology is there. And it turns out that the technology has revealed to us the fact that there's a collective starvation for deep, long-form discussion. And so we're ready for that. And so maybe that niche will be increasingly filled. It seems to be happening. And so um, and that would be a good thing because it seems to me that the way out of our current state of idiot political polarization is, isn't the final establishment that one side is right and the other is wrong, but to engage in sophisticated long-form discussions to deal with the actual problems that are producing the polarization. And maybe we can do that. And maybe this is part of the process by which we do that successful. And that would be a testament to the utility of the reason that you were describing, which is the only alternative to subjugation or violence. Right? We either talk it through, we capitulate, or we tyrannize. Those are the options. So, well, on that note, keep it going for talking it through and for these three guys who presented their ideas. Peterson, like, hijacked things really well. Like, he just hijacked reason and said, like, he was on the side of reason. And, I mean, he sort of is, but not quite the way the objectivist meant it or wanted it. And he just, he just took their thing at the end and, and made it his own and, and came off as the advocate of it, like, even more, more clearly and decisively than the objectivists were. And that wasn't the only time, like, he borrowed some of their ideas and used them for his purposes. And, and they, they just let him and watch it, and they're, they're so passive and dull. He shakes their hand and they're all friends and they didn't threaten him and they were he was the alpha dog and they they played nice and he played nice and it was pretty obvious who was in charge and that was at the objectivist conference Well, that was sad. ARI sucks. Ocon sucks. The end.